Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Please take your seats. I call the General Committee on Political Affairs and Security to order. Dear colleagues, welcome to our annual winter meeting in Vienna. I note that there are a number of new members of our committee, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us for the first time. Let me welcome Let me welcome our committee's new vice chair, Mrs. Sofio Kazarava. Mrs. Kazarava was elected as a vice chair at our 27th annual session in Berlin last July. I'm also pleased to welcome Mr. Alan Farrell, our committee's new rapporteur, who has also been elected at the 2018 annual session. One administrative note for the benefit of the new members. Any member wishing to take the floor in today's debates should please let the staff of the committee know as they are helping us and me keeping a list. Please do so by either raising your hand or coming to the dais. Thank you. We are here already a quite impressive uh, list of uh, speakers. Our uh, first order of business is to adopt the agenda for today's meeting. Can I take it that there are no objections? I don't see any. The agenda is adopted. We now move to the chairman's opening remarks. Let me again welcome you all warmly to our annual winter meeting in Vienna. As it as is our custom, we have a full agenda today, with addresses by our rapporteur, Mrs. Alan Farrell from Ireland, Ambassador Maria Victoria Gonzalez, acting chairperson of the Security Committee of the OSCE and permanent representative of Spain in the OSCE. Here, here. Aquí está. Ambassador Claude Wild. Chairperson of the Forum for Security Cooperation and Permanent Representative of Switzerland to OSCE, Ambassador Lamberto Zanye, OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities. We will then have a special debate on resolving protracted conflicts. The tools and mechanism of OSCE, led by Deputy Secretary General of uh, OSCE Conflict Prevention Center, Mr. Paul Picard and Mr. Charles Lonsdale. The winter meeting serves as an excellent opportunity to come together in our committees and with OSCE officials to exchange ideas and outline our priorities for the coming year. We have the chance to speak with and hear from ambassadors and OSCE institutions and can clearly identify how we as members of the Assembly and of our national parliaments can be most effective in meeting our common objectives of promoting common and comprehensive security and stability in the OSCE area. The 28th annual session in Luxembourg will focus on the role of parliaments in advancing sustainable development to promote security. The United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development sets out many international targets that go hand in hand with the work of OSCE. Our committee's work aligns with goals, goal number 16, promoting peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. I look forward to hearing Rapporteur Alan Farrell's talk on his topic and in his presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, let me finish by saying a few words about the last item of our agenda today, the special debate that is titled Resolving Protracted Conflicts, the Tools and Mechanisms of OSE. Let me first of all uh, thank our uh, Secretariat for providing us a very good fact sheet. You have all received it, I hope. 
a fact sheet on the main mechanism for the resolution of protracted conflicts. It's good to know about what we are speaking when we start speaking. And there are a number of these mechanisms. We will hear about them from our uh, experts and guests today, and then we will work on it uh, in the special uh, debate. The main protracted conflicts that remain high on the OSCE agenda have, of course, been priorities for the work of the Parliamentary Assembly and have been debated in this committee over the years. We cannot, however, allow ourselves to become complacent about resolving these conflicts and must continue to improve on the tools of, at our disposal in order to do so. Let's say Solving or resolving protracted conflicts is a good, a very important priority for us. To do this in times where the risk of starting new conflicts seems to be increasingly high is a real challenge. Looking to the risk of a new nuclear arms race, for instance, we can ask ourselves what is the meaning of dealing with protracted conflicts in some local areas. But we know this is the task we have to, to, to do, we have to assume, and uh, it is uh, our uh, purpose as a parliamentary assembly to support OSCE goals, not only in managing or containing local or regional protracted conflicts, but also in resolving them. In that sense, the remarks, the opening remarks yesterday by our OSCE chairperson in office, uh, Miroslav Lachak, was, uh, inter were interesting. There were a few good news. You remember, peaceful settlement of the North Macedonia-Greece uh, dispute. Some signals of uh, a new si civil society dialogue in Armenia and Azerbaijan. The Transnistrian settlement process going ahead. And at the same time, there are a number of bad news, mostly concerning the Minsk process, which is apparently blocked or even risk a new escalation. The Geneva International discussion on uh, Georgia, Russia, Abkhazia, and South Association not going really fast ahead. Even some multilateral OSCE mechanism. Uh, uh, we will le hear about them, uh, seems to be paralyzed sometimes. It is our goal to give the parliamentary contribution in order to de-block these uh, processes and to make sure that this mechanism can work uh, uh, properly. And it will be our goal today to do it uh, discussing protracted contract con conflicts. It will be our goal in Luxembourg to merge these specific item in the large and the broader frame of the sustainable development goals we are uh, speaking about. The winter meeting presents a prime opportunity for dialogue ex and exchange between the Parliamentary Assembly and senior officials in the OECD, and I look forward to learning from our colleagues about OSCE tools and mechanisms for resolution of protracted conflicts and a fruitful debate on how our committee's work can further this common goal. Let me now proceed, if you agree, to the presentation by colleague Alan Farrell from Ireland, rapporteur of our committee, on the ideas and the intentions regarding his report for the 28th annual session in Luxembourg. Alan, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues. I'm um, delighted to be here um, to present my initial thoughts on the uh, report of the first committee. Um, I'd like to thank uh, colleagues for their support in Berlin, and uh, I very much look forward to the opportunity of working closely with you uh, as we work towards the um, Parliamentary Assembly summer meeting. Um, as the largest regional security organization in the world, the Parliamentary Assembly uh, is vital uh, in terms of its role in advancing global efforts towards promoting security. And as such, our OSCE is an essential conduit to which progress um, towards sustainable development to promote security throughout our region. In this context, we must be mindful of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2015. And in particular, the General Committee on Political Affairs and Security is most concerned with the Sustainable Development Goal number 16, promoting peaceful, inclusive societies for sustainable development. 
without sustainable development amongst our countries developing, any security agenda becomes a more difficult task. And in order to achieve objectives set out <clears throat> under Sustainable Development Goal 16, we must advance the access for our citizens to justice and to ensure we have adequate institutions at all levels for this, which are both accountable and inclusive. With regard to accountable and inclusive institutions, I note the commitment to ensure better multilateralism set out by current OSCE Chairman in Office uh, Miroslav Lacek. Uh, this commitment will work towards strengthening trusted institutions and therefore advance the goal of improving security for all our citizens. A fundamental factor in developing accountable and inclusive institutions in order to advance sustainable development to promote security is of course the democratic process. Institutions at all levels, international, national and indeed local, must be accountable to the communities and constituencies that they represent. Therefore that domestic, um, democratic I should say, process at each level must be fully transparent and allow citizens to have their voices heard. It is a fact that enhancing and improving fair and efficient, effective and indeed efficient justice institutions is essential to promote security and sustainable growth within communities in each member state within the OSCE. I again note the OSCE Slovak chairmanship has set youth as the priority for 2019 and indeed as the chairperson of my own parliamentary Committee on Children and Youth Affairs involving our youth and indeed minorities in promoting gender equalities within our institutions is vital in, in terms of ensuring inclusivity and that the needs of our communities are represented to the greatest possible extent. Doing this will build connections between our populations and these institutions and therefore work to bolster security within our communities by fostering increased levels of dialogue between both people and institutions representing them. To increase youth involvement in both parliaments and the parliamentary process, we can look to the examples of Interparliamentary Union Forum of Young Parliamentarians, the Young Atlantic Treaty Association, and indeed the European Youth Parliament. With regard to gender, I wish to note the OSCE's commitment under UNHCSCR 1325 on women in peace and security and indeed <coughs> Article 20 of the Berlin Declara Declaration which states that sustainable peace is inextricably linked to women's partition, participation and influence in decision making in order to prevent, manage and resolve conflicts in the post-conflict relief and recovery. In noting these points we must acknowledge of course that this has been repeatedly repeatedly proven that the active involvement of women in decision making and institution building has been has had an extraordinarily positive impact on conflict resolution and security and indeed developing sustainable peace and I would like at this point to note uh, the presence and, and continued contribution of Canadian MP Heidi Fry on this matter which I think is all, has been continually welcomed by this parliamentary assembly Parliaments have an important role to play in advancing sustainable development to pro promote security. The OSCPA's Berlin Declaration is our guiding document in this regard and sets out recommendations for the role of parliaments in strengthening institutions for security. In particular, I wish to reference Article 45 in which the OSCPA encourages parliaments to actively support the structured dialogue process by discussion discussing current and future challenges and risks to security in the Parliamentary Assembly's area and fostering greater understanding of the issue. Article 46 in which the Parliamentary Assembly recommends that parliaments establish and strengthen parliamentary bod bodies for a priori and ex post facto scrutiny of security and intelligence, intelligence services activities, providing them with appropriate mandates and resources in order to eff ensure effective democratic oversight of intelligence activities, and Article 47, in which the Parliamentary Assembly recalls that the mediation and dialogue are widely recognized as cost-effective ways of preventing, managing and resolving conflicts and encourages the Parliamentary Assembly to continue to take an active role in mediation. The role of parliaments in advancing sustainable development to promote security is largely through utilising the role of parliaments to facilitate dialogue, implement legislation, review the work of governments and engage with citizens to raise 
public awareness. Furthermore, parliaments have a fundamental role in ensuring governments remain accountable to their citizens and their actions are transparent and that all actions which work towards building and developing sustainable peace are both inclusive and people-centred. By working together, we of course can strengthen the role of our parliaments and our institution by sharing best practice through internal committees and multilateral parliamentary assemblies such as our own OSCE. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention and I do very much welcome the opportunity to hear your views on my initial thoughts for our declaration for next summer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, and sorry for not introducing you before, but for our colleagues who don't know you already, uh, you are uh, head of the Irish delegation to our assembly. You serve in this position since 2013, and you've been elected in the Irish House of Representatives in 2011, re-elected 2016. You are serving currently as chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on Children and Youth Affairs and member of the Public Accounts Committee. So sorry for not uh, recalling your personal record. Uh, I'm certain that uh, Mr. Farrell's presentation has generated responses from our members. As it is our custom, we will now proceed to a discussion regarding, regarding Mrs. Mr. Farrell's presentations. Uh, we have now eight speakers for this first debate, and the list is closed, and we will then go on with the next, next debates later on. I call for a first intervention, Mr. Anton Herashenko, Ukraine. Спасибо, уважаемый председательствующий. Украинская делегация и народ Украины хотели бы на летней сессии БСЕ, чтобы был отражен в докладе оценка агрессивных действий российской военщины по незаконному пиратскому нападению на три украинских военных корабля, которые мирно собирались последовать в Азовское море в акваторию, которая принадлежит государству Украина. Мы считаем действия Российской Федерации, которая открыла огонь по мирным украинским военным кораблям, что привело к ранению нескольких наших военнослужащих, а также задержала абсолютно незаконно в нарушении всех международных правил 24 украинских моряка, чтобы этому была дана оценка организации в безопасности сотрудничеству в Европе. Напомню, что в истории Европы неоднократно военные конфликты начинались после того, что одни для государства Государства, такие как нацистская Германия, чувствуя свою безнаказанность, похваляя своей безнаказанностью, открывали войны, начиная с разного рода провокативных инцидентов. Если организация безопасности и сотрудничества Европы, в частности парламентская ассамблея, не будет давать свои жесткой оценки подобным действиям Российской Федерации, это может привести к дальнейшему к разворотованию широкомасштабного военного конфликта в Европе, так же, как это было в годы Второй мировой войны. Нельзя оставлять такие поводы без внимания. Thank you, Mr. Harashenko. Floor is to Mr. Tulebek Mukashev from Kazakhstan. Уважаемые коллеги, дамы и господа, Астанинская декларация ОБСЕ 2010 года. Наши лидеры заложили тезис о том, что безопасность каждого государства, участника ОБСЕ, неразрывно связана с безопасностью всех других государств. На фоне роста современных вызовов и угроз на пространстве ОБСЕ данный тест становится все более актуальным. Казахстан рассматривает многосторонний многоуровневую дипломатию в качестве стратегического ресурса внешней политики. Мы считаем, что необходим инклюзивный диалог между ведущими державами для преодоления блокового мышления и достижения консенсуса по ключевым вопросам мировой повестки дня. Конфликты на пространстве ОБСЕ должны решаться дипломатическими средствами на основе принципа коллективной ответственности. Инициатива президента Казахстана Нурсултана Назарбаева по проведению встречи между глобальными игроками США, Российской Федерации, Китайской Народной Республики и Евросоюзом конференции ОБСЕ по актуальным вопросам безопасности в 2020 году. Встречи секретариата в ОБСЕ, СВНД и региональной формы АСЕАН служат этой цели. Уважаемые коллеги, в Казахстане выражают серьезную обеспокоенность распространением транснациональных угроз в регионе Центральной Азии и за ее пределами. 
Мы считаем, что особое внимание заслуживает обсуждение мер коллективного противодействия стран участниц ОБСЕ новым трансграничным вызовам и угрозам для их безопасности, международному терроризму, насильственному экстремизму, незаконному обороту наркотиков и торговле людьми, кибератакам и другим. Ситуация в Афганистане играет особую роль в обеспечении долгосрочной стабильности и безопасности для стран нашего региона. Мы все понимаем, что без решения афганской проблемы, без привлечения Афганистана и региональные процессы невозможно обеспечить долгосрочную стабильность в регионе. В ходе председательства Казахстана в Совете Безопасности Организации Объединенных Наций в январе 2018 года моя страна организовала министерские дебаты построение регионального партнерства в Афганистане и Центральной Азии в качестве модели взаимозависимости, безопасности и развития. Летом этого года мы планируем провести мероприятие ОБСЕ высокого уровня по Афганистану в Астане. Спасибо, благодарю за внимание. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My dear colleagues, uh, I need to raise an issue that should be of general concern to the membership of this committee and the entire parliamentary assembly. The OSCE is, OSCE is an organization that, among its many laudable goals and objectives, serves as a guarantor of the electoral process of our participating states. We have collectively in many ways set the gold standard for how elections should be conducted. In this context, it is especially troubling that one of our own participating states should engage in extensive state-sponsored efforts to undermine the free and fair conduct of elections in other participating states. My colleagues, it is indisputable that the Russian government seeks to attack and even undermine the integrity of our elections and of our democratic processes. Our intelligence agencies have stated categorically and publicly that Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered an influence campaign in 2016 aimed at the United States presidential election. This continued in the by-elections of 2018, targeted not only toward the machinery of the election process, but also involving efforts to foment disunity, strife, and distrust among our citizens. Reputable non-governmental organizations tracking continuing Russian malign influence in democratic processes in the OSC area named um, the recent referendum in North Macedonia as an example. They cite continuing Russian information operations, disinformation operations in the Baltics, Central Asia, the Caucasus, and Eastern Europe. The actions of the Russian government are simply unacceptable. Suggestions by the Kremlin and its allies that this is not taking place are simply not credible and, as I say, are countered by reputable NGOs across the region. To my other colleagues in this room, we must all have our eyes wide open to this unacceptable behavior by one of our participating states. This will be particularly true in the near term to our friends in Ukraine whose citizens are already suffering from a brutal war entirely invented and perpetrated by the Kremlin. As we look ahead to the Ukrainian presidential elections next month, we can only assume that the Russian government is mobilizing every resource at its disposal to undermine the free choice of the Ukrainian people. I have no doubt that the future of Ukraine is a bright one, and it needs to be, uh, despite the challenges that it faces today. My country will continue to support the choice of the Ukrainian people toward a peaceful, secure, and prosperous Euro-Atlantic future. Ukraine is just one example. Its neighbor Moldova has a parliamentary election this weekend. For any election to be seen as credible, it must be free and fair, which means we must all be more aware of and proactive in countering Russia's efforts to undermine the, the democratic process throughout the OSCE region. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator. The floor is to Monsieur Roger no, Joris Pochet de Belgique. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. I would like to congratulate the Slovak Presidency with their excellent choice of priorities 
which we fully support, the focus on security sector and government reform, where we should implement the norms and values of this assembly of our organization, the OSCE, within reform in the security sector and government sector. Secondly, their uh, priority for effective multilateralism. To tackle current and future challenges, we need to talk and listen to each other. And for Belgium, the multilateral approach is crucial. As Mr. Farrell said, uh, trustworthy and efficient institutions are paramount for this. The OSCE has an important role to play because it is one of the few places where different parties and conflict are still meeting. And we should keep this this way. Keep it this way. Secondly, we as MPs, we or senators, we are all representing people. And we have a role to play in supporting the SMM in Ukraine, uh, for which the first priority should be the safety and security of the monitors. But we also should never forget that as representatives of the people, we should uh, take care that the civil population, who has been suffering for five years already, have correct living conditions. And therefore, uh, we would like to call up upon the conflicting parties to do everything possible to protect this civil population. Thank you. Thank you. Well, floor is to Gaspadin Vladimir Jabarov, Russian Federation. Спасибо. Для существующей власти Украины стартовавшая президентская избирательная кампания стала очередным поводом к нагнетанию антироссийской истерии. Киев отказал в аккредитации российских представителей в составе миссии БТИПЧ ОБСЕ по наблюдению за предстоящими выборами. Причем украинские власти не только запрещают въезд наших граждан из числа официально включенных в состав международных мониторинговых миссий, но и вообще законодательно закрепляют запрет россиянам наблюдать за электоральными процессами в Украине. Верховная Рада внесла соответствующие поправки в действующее законодательство. Это прямое нарушение обязательств Киева в ОБСЕ. В этой связи подчеркну, что все представители государств-участников в составе наблюдателей действуют не в личном или национальном качестве, а как эксперты международной мониторинговой команды. Всем хорошо известно, что, в том числе и Киеву, что решение о включении в число наблюдателей принимается руководством бюро и соответствующей миссией отнюдь не властями, проводящего выборы государства. Киевом принято абсурдное решение отказаться от открытия избирательных участков в дипломатических и консульских учреждениях России, якобы из-за неспособности Москвы обеспечить надлежащие условия для проведения выборов. Расцениваем это как дискриминацию и нарушение конституционных прав миллионов украинских граждан, находящихся в России, а также обязательств Украины в рамках Копенгагенского документа. Следует отдать должное, уважаемый госпожа Гизлат Доттер, директор БТБС, которая заняла принципиальную позицию и не пошла на поводу Киева в его попытках ограничить допуск российских наблюдателей. Бюро пригласило всех государств участников, включая Российскую Федерацию, представить своих кандидатов. Спасибо. Мистер Андрей Рыбак, Беларусь. Спасибо, господин председатель. Я благодарю уважаемого председателя Первого общего комитета господина Филиппа Ломбарди и докладчика комитета господина Алла Фарла за презентацию идеи и концепции тематического доклада. Предложения задают необходимые ориентиры по оптимизации наших усилий для адекватного и своевременного реагирования на вызовы в области военно-политического измерения безопасности. Республика Беларусь, являясь донором региональной безопасности, уделяет большое внимание данным вопросам. Как известно, глава белорусского государства уже неоднократно ставил перед международным сообществом вопрос о запуске нового хельсинского процесса. Эта инициатива направлена на восстановление доверия, укрепление безопасности и сотрудничества на пространстве ОБСЕ. Белорусская сторона еще раз подтверждает готовность максимально подключиться к тематике борьбы с комплексными транснациональными вызовами и угрозами. Антитеррористическая проблематика остается одним из важнейших направлений деятельности как Комитета по политическим вопросам безопасности, так и всей организации. Хотели бы акцентировать нацеленность белорусской делегации на серьезную совместную работу в данном направлении. 
В октябре прошлого года, года в городе Минске прошла, э, была успешно проведена конференция ОБСЕ высокого уровня по предотвращению и борьбе с терроризмом в цифровую эпоху. Мы намерены и далее последовательно развивать эту тему на Минской площадке, в том числе в рамках совместной повестки ОБСЕ и ООН. В фокусе ОБСЕ также должна оставаться борьба с незаконным оборотом наркотиков. В 2018 году в городе Минске совместными усилиями с секретариатом ОБСЕ был успешно проведен очередной региональный тренинг. Мероприятие было посвящено вопросам проведения расследований в сфере противодействия незаконным наркотикам, включая новые психоактивные вещества, в том числе распространяемым с использованием виртуального пространства. Рассматриваем это как логическое продолжение, инициированное нами в ходе Минской сессии по ОБСЕ резолюции «Разработка современных и эффективных законодательных нормативных административных мер реагирования на появление новых психоактивных веществ». Готовы наращивать предметное взаимовыгодное сотрудничество в данном направлении. Беларусь вносит вклад и в тему реформы сектора безопасности. В частности, в ноябре прошлого года совместно с секретариатом ОБСЕ и Управлением по наркотикам и преступности ООН мы провели региональный семинар в городе Минске на тему роль хорошо управляемого и подотчетного сектора безопасности в борьбе с транснациональными угрозами. Член нашей делегации Сергей Рахманов принял участие в качестве основного докладчика в пленарном заседании форума по сотрудничеству в области безопасности ОБСЕ по теме демократический контроль над вооруженными силами. Беларусь традиционно активно участвует в мероприятиях по выполнению резолюции Совета безопасности ООН 1540. Очередной вклад нашей страны в текущем году по данной проблематике, предстоящий в городе Минске 3-4 апреля регионального, проведение регионального семинара. Его организаторами также выступает Центр по предотвращению конфликтов ОБСЕ, Комитет Совета Безопасности ООН и Управление ООН по вопросам разоружения. Отмечаю важность дальнейшего рассмотрения в рамках ОБСЕ темы легкого и стрелкового оружия и запасов обычных вооружений. Готовы делиться соответствующим опытом и практикой. Приложим максимум усилий для эффективного проведения в городе Минске 16-17 апреля 2019 года регионального семинара по деактивации легкого и стрелкового оружия. Приглашаем коллег к участию в этих мероприятиях. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо. Господин Леонид Слуцкий, Russian Federation. Спасибо. Мы поддерживаем приоритеты председательства Словакии в ОБСЕ и блестящий системный доклад господина Фаррелла, особенно то, что касается молодежного сотрудничества, взаимодействия между молодыми парламентариями, что сегодня еще недостаточно практикуется на пространстве ОБСЕ. К большому сожалению, я вынужден посвятить большую часть драгоценного времени, отведенного мне, на то, чтобы объяснить нашему уважаемому собранию то, что прозвучало из уст э, господина Геращенко, является абсолютным измышлением. Сегодня Керченская акватория является неотъемлемой частью территориальных вод Российской Федерации. Необходимо понимать, что на политической карте мира произошли необратимые изменения – в четком соответствии с уставом Организации Объединенных Наций и его, статье, его статьей о праве наций на самоопределение. Российские вооруженные силы и военный морской флот защищают свои территориальные воды, и в данном случае от провокации, которой сегодня дана заслуженная оценка Большой Палатой Европейского Суда по правам человека в Страсбурге, который отказал Украине в, при... в принятии к рассмотрению запроса о якобы имевшем место инциденте в Керченском проливе. Россия здесь абсолютно права и действует в соответствии со своими конституционными нормами в интересах обеспечения безопасности. Не следует передергивать и вводить в заблуждение наше высокое собрание. Особо должен сказать о выступлении сенатора Роджера Уикера. Мы неоднократно приглашали американских коллег к диалогу. Давайте проведем семинар. Конференцию. Сегодня две крупнейшие ядерные державы не имеют права иметь столь сложные отношения по вине 
к сожалению, американской стороны, которая использует любую ситуацию, чтобы деформировать образ России в мире и в том числе в нашей организации. Мы никогда не вмешивались и не имеем возможности вмешиваться в выборы в Соединенных Штатах Америки. И этому нет ни одного субстантивного подтверждения. Я прошу сенатора Викера изменить свою риторику, и он совершенно также не прав в отношении, еще раз подчеркиваю, Украины. Спасибо за внимание. Thank you. We have the two last speakers for this debate. Mr. Artur Gerasimov of Ukraine. Uh, dear Mr. Lombardi, dear colleagues, uh, we just said a uh, word from uh, Russian Federation about uh, observers from Russian Federation to the election, presidential elections uh, which will be held in Ukraine in the end of March. Let me one more time remind that already five years there is the ongoing Russian aggression on the Ukrainian territory. And we have part of the Ukraine occupied by Russia, I mean Crimea and Donbass. Also, let me also remind to our colleagues that by Ukrainian legislation, Russia recognized as an aggressor country as, and as occupying power of part of Donbass and Crimea. And also, uh, moreover, We analyzed the documents of uh, our organization. There is no one document which contains obligations to invite all participating states. But at the same time, we uh, from Ukraine inviting as much as possible observers to our elections because we really want to organize free, transparent, democratic elections in Ukraine. And the last but not least, There is the reality when there is the reality when the one country started attack to the other country and after want to send observers to the elections. And I think we need really very deep conversations with Odir, with uh, within our organization about maybe changing the rules about the topics like that. Thank you. Last speaker for this debate, Mr. Gennady, Mr. Gennady Onyshenko, Russian Federation. Господин Ломбарди, прежде всего, разрешите восхититься вашим уникальным талантом ведения подобных совещаний. Это дает нам возможность нормально работать. Господин Форелл обозначил, мне кажется, все основные приоритеты, которые мы будем обсуждать в рамках словак... Словацкого саммита. Но мне кажется, сегодня пришло время, раз мы уже заговорили в, в рамках военно-политической безопасности о легком и стрелковом оружии, поднять очень важный вопрос, который грозит всем странам Европы. Это не исполнение Соединенными Штатами Америки сенаторы которых здесь присутствуют, одного из важнейших меморандумов 1972 года, КБТО, Конвенции по биологическому и токсинному оружию. Это выражается в том, что за последние 10-15 лет на территории постсоветского пространства Пентагон с подачи сенаторов Соединенных Штатов, поскольку они утверждают бюджет страны своей, построили военно-биологические базы, которые способны производить огромное количество биологического потенциала, которое прямо угрожает жизни жителей Европы и, конечно же, России. Поэтому все те военно-биологические лаборатории, которые находятся на территории стран Европы и которые продолжают строиться, должны быть соответствующим образом в формате компетенции нашей конференции обсуждены с точки зрения гражданского общества, с точки зрения дачи этой, этому событию политических оценок. Мне было, верите, приятно слышать, что моя страна выбрала президента Соединенных Штатов. Я восхищен ораторским искусством сенатора, но я не услышал ни одного конкретного факта, который бы он привел. Поэтому я предлагаю успокоиться и нам дать возможность в рамках Словацкого саммита затронуть главную проблему биологической, военно-биологической угрозы народам наших стран, которая идет со стороны Соединенных Штатов Америки. Благодарю вас. Спасибо большое.
first debate and uh, I'm confident that our rapporteur will have plenty of material to work with for his report. Thank you for this uh, discussion. I give Alan Farrell the floor for a, for, for a short replic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, just very, very briefly, um, I've been taking extensive notes, so I will take uh, what you have said and factor it into considerations for our report in the summer. Um, I think there is certainly food for thought in relation to a number of factors um, in relation to counter-terrorism, and I think this is an area of particular interest, and I don't wish to uh, necessarily limit the focus of our summer resolution, but at the same time, I think, as I said to the chairman at the start of our meeting, I think it is important that we uh, in order to be effective, I think we should focus a little, the lens a little bit tighter, uh, rather than try to be too broad in terms of our resolution and, and, and find ourselves in a position where we're not necessarily as effective as we could be. But I do welcome the contributions of all members um, from multiple states, and um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Alan. We will have a good work from here to Luxembourg in July. And uh, I conclude this uh, agenda point. Please notice that for the coming debates, we, al we are also closing the uh, speakers list. And that uh, time, um, speaking time will be two minutes also for the other debates. We now come to fourth item on our agenda. It is a presentation by Ambassador Maria Victoria Gonzalez, Acting Chairperson of the Security Committee of the OSCE Permanent Council and Permanent Representative of Spain to OSCE. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us today. Let me introduce Ambassador Gonzalez to you all. Ambassador has been the Permanent Representative of Spain to OSCE since 2015 and is currently Acting Chairperson of the Security Committee of the OSCE Permanent Council. Previously, she was assigned to the Embassy of Spain in Gabon, Bolivia, Belgium, and the Czech Republic. Señora, usted tiene la palabra. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Thank you very much. If you allow me, and as I did last year, I will continue my intervention in Spanish. Señor presidente. Muchas gracias por invitarme a dirigirme a los miembros de este Comité General de Asuntos Políticos y de Seguridad de la Asamblea Parlamentaria de la OSCE en calidad de presidenta en funciones del Comité de Seguridad del Consejo Permanente. Como sabrán, España ha, continuado, eh, ha ofrecido continuar asumiendo la presidencia del Comité temporalmente mientras la presidencia eslovaca continúa sus consultas para designar un nuevo presidente del Comité. Estamos asistiendo a la presidencia en ejercicio, en la preparación del programa de trabajo para el año 2019 y es por tanto un honor y un privilegio para mí estar aquí hoy con ustedes. Esta es una excelente oportunidad, creo, para hacer un balance de lo que eh, hicimos el año pasado y buscar formas para fortalecer la buena cooperación que existe entre la Asamblea Parlamentaria y las estructuras gubernamentales de la organización y en particular el Consejo e identificar intereses comunes en los que podemos trabajar juntos y crear sinergias. Permítame subrayar ahora en el comienzo que el tema de la mujer en el sector de la seguridad y cómo su participación eh, contribuye a mejorar el concepto integral de la seguridad seguirá siendo una prioridad para el trabajo del comité. El hecho de que el comité de seguridad fuera presidido el año pasado por primera vez por una mujer da cuenta de la, de, del camino que tenemos por delante para reforzar la presencia de las mujeres en este sector. Es, por lo tanto, un tema transversal eh, que continuará siendo una prioridad dentro del trabajo de este año. Pues bien, el año pasado eh, tuvimos como tema principal eh, el combate contra los tráficos ilícitos y sus vínculos con el terrorismo y la delincuencia transnacional organizada. 
Teniendo en cuenta este tema general para, para el año, eh, podría destacar tres prioridades fundamentales. Los tráficos ilícitos, en particular la trata de seres humanos, armas, drogas, bienes culturales, residuos peligrosos, como fenómenos transfronterizos vinculados con grupos de delincuencia transnacional organizada, blanqueo internacional de capitales y redes de corrupción, así como con organizaciones terroristas. El segundo gran tema del año fue terrorismo y abordamos especialmente la seguridad de fronteras y el intercambio de información para contrarrestar la amenaza que supone el regreso de los combatientes terroristas extranjeros como una contribución de la OSCE a la aplicación de la resolución del Consejo de Seguridad de Naciones Unidas 2396. También abordamos en este epígrafe la protección de los eh, blancos blandos, eh, soft targets, incluyendo nuevas capacidades ofensivas como el uso de material nuclear, radiológico, biológico y químico y el material de doble uso. Se trata de un, un tema que fue nuevo para la agenda del comité. Los temas de NRBQ se tratan normalmente... En, la, en esta organización desde el punto de vista del desarme y la no proliferación en el foro de cooperación para la cooperación y seguridad pero eh, quisimos darle un enfoque eh, más eh, dirigido al terrorismo eh, y en particular a la protección de las infraestructuras críticas el tercer, la tercera gran área de, de trabajo fue la ciberseguridad eh, mantuvimos una discusión muy interesante sobre el fomento de la confianza en el sector cibernético el papel de los partenariados público-privados para contrarrestar las amenazas a la ciberseguridad y para explorar maneras para involucrar mejor al sector privado cuando se abordan estos desafíos. En, a lo largo del año mantuvimos ocho sesiones de trabajo, tres de las cuales fueron conjuntas con otros comités, porque como sabemos bien en esta organización eh, la seguridad no puede dividirse en... en en sitios eh, eh, separados, sino que debe abordarse desde una perspectiva conjunta. Por lo tanto, llevamos a cabo dos, tres reuniones, eh, una reunión con los tres comités en julio sobre la lucha contra el tráfico de seres humanos a lo largo de las rutas de migración, una reunión con el Comité de la Dimensión Humana sobre Mujeres, Paz y Seguridad, en la incorporar el aspecto civil, y una con el Comité Económico y Medioambiental sobre Medio Ambiente y la Delincuencia Transnacional Organizada. Pues bien, ¿cuáles fueron los resultados al final de año en la Ministerial de Milán? Eh, a lo largo del año destacamos eh, o identificamos dos áreas principales de interés para las delegaciones. Una de ellas era el retorno de los combatientes terroristas extranjeros, fue un tema que dominó los debates a lo largo del año, y la protección de infraestructuras críticas, y el segundo, la lucha contra el tráfico de bienes culturales. Sobre estos dos eh, temas, eh, la presidencia en ejercicio eh, presentó en dos proyectos de declaración que fueron objeto de extensas negociaciones. En materia de terrorismo hubo también un tercer proyecto para, para la negociación que propuso la Federación Rusa y que respaldó la presidencia italiana sobre los esfuerzos de la OSCE para prevenir y luchar contra el terrorismo. Consideramos que el terrorismo sigue siendo un tema fundamental en, nuestra, en nuestro trabajo y se exploraron vías para incorporar más a las capitales a nuestros, a nuestros debates, los representantes oficiales de las capitales y crear alguna, algún otro tipo de estructura que permitiera seguir debatiendo con mayor profundidad los temas de terrorismo. <coughs> Perdón. Finalmente, ninguno de estos eh, tres ámbitos o tres proyectos de, de declaración eh, pudo reunirse el consenso. Eh, creo, sin embargo, que eh, los resultados no pueden medirse únicamente en términos de número. Eh, tuvimos unas negociaciones muy intensas, eh, importantes. Eh, entendimos mejor cuáles son las líneas rojas de algunas delegaciones. Eh, avanzamos en el lenguaje, en, en, en numerosos temas. Y creo que, en, en conjunto, fue un trabajo eh, bueno para, para continuarlo este año. Y, uh, y en definitiva estos son temas que siguen estando en la agenda del comité eh, con lo cual podemos decir que no, no partimos de cero eh, por lo que se refiere a las prioridades para 2019 
Como ellos saben, en la presidencia en ejercicio, la presidencia eslovaca eh, quiere centrarse en hacer un trabajo eficaz, pragmático y orientado a los resultados en línea con su lema, que es por las personas, el diálogo y la seguridad. Entre las prioridades de la presidencia eslovaca puedo mencionar eh, desde luego el, el, la gobernanza del sector de la seguridad y su reforma como parte del enfoque integral de la OSCE en la seguridad. Esta es una de las prioridades de la presidencia eslovaca que como muchos de ustedes saben preside el grupo informal de trabajo, el, perdón, el grupo informal de amigos de reforma del sector de la seguridad y la gobernanza eh, y será un elemento importante en el trabajo del Comité de Seguridad que busca, en el que perseguiremos eh, un sector de la seguridad inclusivo, responsable y gobernado democráticamente que promueva la confianza y contribuya a la estabilidad en el área OSCE y más allá. Eh, el objetivo para este año será, por lo tanto, eh, intentar eh, encontrar un entendimiento común sobre eh, el sector de la seguridad y la gobernanza. Un segundo ámbito de trabajo será, continuará siendo la ciberseguridad, las nuevas tecnologías. El Comité de Seguridad apoyará los esfuerzos de la Presidencia en ejercicio para desarrollar una base más sólida para la cooperación internacional en materia de protección de infraestructuras críticas, basándose en los resultados de la Semana de la Seguridad Cibernética en Viena de marzo, que estará dedicada precisamente a la protección de infraestructuras críticas así como la conferencia sobre seguridad cibernética que se celebrará en Pratislava en junio. El Comité de Seguridad seguirá trabajando también estrechamente con el Grupo Informal de Ciberseguridad que preside el embajador de Hungría, Carolidán. Tercer ámbito eh, y, y también muy importante, la lucha contra el terrorismo. Seguirá siendo prioridad del Comité. Eh, la presidencia eslovaca ha incluido ya eh, en su programa la conferencia de lucha contra el terrorismo eh, el 25 y 26 de marzo en Bratislava y se complementará con las discusiones del Comité de Seguridad sobre eh, violencia, extremismo y radicalización violenta, eh, sobre aplicación de la resolución 29, 2396 y aspectos tales como el control de fronteras, la protección de infraestructuras críticas, todos estos temas que ya ven, en los que ya hemos venido trabajando el pasado año continuarán siendo parte de los debates del comité. Finalmente, las áreas de juventud y género, así como un compromiso multilateral eficaz, serán también incorporadas a estos trabajos. Por lo que se refiere a los métodos de trabajo, el año pasado in introdujimos algunas, eh, algunas novedades, eh, buscamos una mayor participación de las estructuras de la OSCE, eh, la participación de las misiones del en el terreno cuando, podía ser, eh, cuando era posible eh, y, y bueno, elaboramos notas de concepto que eh, no se venía haciendo con anterioridad, pero en definitiva yo creo que este año el, el comité seguirá buscando o seguirá los métodos de trabajo eh, que utilizamos el pasado año y buscará, eh, sin duda, una mayor participación de los estados participantes. El comité es de todos los estados y creemos que hay un margen de mejora para que los, eh, las delegaciones de los estados participantes se impliquen en mayor medida. Finalmente, eh, y para concluir, me voy a referir, a, a, si me lo permiten, a la interacción entre la Asamblea Parlamentaria y las estructuras de la OSCE. Eh, la Asamblea Parlamentaria tiene diferentes comités eh, que son de interés para el Comité de Seguridad y en particular el, este Comité General sobre Asuntos Políticos y de Seguridad, el Comité General sobre Democracia, Derechos Humanos y Cuestiones Humanitarias, el Comité Ad Hoc sobre Migración y muy en particular el Comité Ad Hoc de Lucha contra el Terrorismo, en cuyas discusiones participé el miércoles y eh, que contiene una uh, amplia variedad de conocimientos eh, que, que nos pueden ser de utilidad. También eh, en, el, en el Comité de Seguridad contamos con la participación eh, del presidente de la Comit Comisión Ad Hoc contra el Terrorismo, el señor Makis Boridis, en dos sesiones del Comité de Seguridad. Fueron dos sesiones importantes, una de ellas dedicada a la, al combate de los, te de los eh, terroristas extranjeros y eh, la segunda eh, en la que el, el señor Boridis presentó la resolución de la Asamblea Parlamentaria de la la OSCE sobre prevención y lucha contra el terrorismo y BELT. 
esta resolución que ustedes adoptaron el pasado año se resultó de, de gran interés para, para los trabajos del comité y para la, el proyecto de declaración que, que nosotros eh, estuvimos negociando eh, con, la, con vistas a la ministerial de Milán. Permítanme también que me refiera a la organización en Madrid en noviembre de una conferencia organizada por el Parlamento Español sobre víctimas del terrorismo que reunió a representantes de las asociaciones de víctimas de toda la región de la OSCE. Como ustedes saben, esta es una prioridad también para mi país que ha sufrido durante años el azote del terrorismo. Bien, pues en mi experiencia al frente del comité el pasado año eh, he, considerado, he encontrado muy útil esta interacción con la Asamblea Parlamentaria y como tuve oportunidad de manifestar en la, en la Comisión Ad hoc contra el Terrorismo, la Asamblea Parlamentaria tiene un, el potencial de realizar un papel importante apoyando las estructuras ejecutivas de la OSCE en la aplicación de los compromisos. Eh, como por ejemplo mencionaría la posibilidad de, de que los parlamentarios pudieran sensibilizar a los distintos estados participantes sobre la importancia de los compromisos de la OSCE en materia de lucha contra el terrorismo o bien ejercer una función de supervisión pidiendo a los parlamentos nacionales investigar conforme a sus procedimientos nacionales respectivos el estado de la aplicación de estos compromisos por sus respectivos gobiernos o informar sobre el apoyo que la OSCE puede proporcionar en este campo. En, de en definitiva, creo que estos intercambios han sido muy útiles para conocer las últimas iniciativas que son relevantes para el trabajo tanto de la Asamblea Parlamentaria como del Comité de Seguridad y tenemos previsto continuar con esta práctica este año, identificando las áreas en las que podemos unir nuestro esfuerzo y trabajo conjunto con el fin de fortalecer aún más la fructífera cooperación ya existente entre nuestros respectivos organismos. Gracias de nuevo por invitarme a dirigirme a, esta, a este comité y quedo a su disposición para cualquier pregunta o comentario. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, señora embajadora. Colegas, we now turn to a key element of the Assembly's winter meetings which I refer, uh, referenced earlier, a direct exchange with the government side of the OSCE, represented here by senior OSCE officials, the national diplomats who are driving the OSCE agenda. This dialogue between parliamentarians and executive branch officials is particularly valuable aspect of our time here. Our next speaker is Ambassador Claude Wild, chairperson of the Forum for Security Cooperation and permanent representative of Switzerland to the OIC. Welcome, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Wilder has served in the Swiss diplomatic services since 1992. His extremely distinguished career has seen him deployed work all over the world in Swiss embassies in Nigeria, Moscow, Canada, and as a deputy head of the Swiss mission to the European Union in Brussels. In 2010, he was appointed ambassador and head of the Swiss Federal Department for Foreign Affairs, Human Security Division. Ambassador Bild has been ambassador of Switzerland to the international organizations in Vienna since 2015 and is currently heading the Forum for Security and Cooperation for the Swiss chairmanship from January to April 2019. It's only last four months, but it's very interesting. Ambassador, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President, honorable members of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to elaborate on the Swiss chairmanship of the Forum for Security Cooperation, referred to as FSC, which is running from January to April 2019. Since the opening of the Swiss FSC chairmanship by our State Secretary on January 16th, we have so far conducted four security dialogues on the following topics. Private military and security companies, small arms and light weapons and stockpiles of conventional ammunition, aspects of modern warfare, and the better implementation of the Vienna document 2011 and it, its existing tools. In addition, this week we held a joint FSCPC with the Slovak chairmanship on lessons learned on conflict resolution with a perspective by the former Prime Minister of Ireland, Bertie Ahern, a specialist in conflict resolution. 
Ladies and gentlemen, in the field of the politico-military dimension of the OSCE, the Forum for Security Cooperation is a unique platform to address security challenges and opportunities alike. This is done always having in mind our founding principles, agreed norms and commitments, and the importance of upholding them, in particularly the Helsinki Decalogue and the Charter of Paris. In view of both the topic covered and the underlying principles of our efforts, we much appreciate the interest of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly in the work of the FSC. In times where continuing erosion of trust stops us from moving forward, the political support of elected national parliamentarians is of great importance. Now allow me to give you some insights on the principles, goals, and programs of our FSC chairmanship. As stated, Switzerland considers the FSC a unique platform to approach questions in an inclusive and pragmatic manner. This is why Switzerland has put the principle of cooperation and pragmatism at the core of its work as chair. When we were preparing our chairmanship, we thus asked ourselves, how can Switzerland help to increase confidence and transparency in the current environment of the OSCE political military sphere. What potential of existing commitments and tools are there to be explored? To answer these questions, we decided to aim our chairmanship on a better implementation of existing commitments and on a more efficient use of existing tools in order to explore their full potential. On the backdrop of the current crisis in European security, this is of course easier said than done. The conflict in and around Ukraine puts the European security architecture, including set commitments and tools, to a serious test. The conflict in and around Ukraine led to a loss of confidence which is unprecedented in the last 10 years. As a regional army arrangement under Chapter 8 of the UN Charter, the OSCE has a crucial role to play in helping to solve this conflict and through this main task in rebuilding mutual military trust and confidence in Europe. At the same time, we consider and reflect upon developments in other OSCE fora, such as the Structured Dialogue on pressing issues of European security. We noted that the structured dialogue has developed in a constructive manner with increasingly interactive debates between states. It also proves to be a useful framework for innovative ideas that could be taken up by the FSC within plenary discussions but also through its working groups. With the goal of using our FSC chairmanship to focus on a better implementation of existing confidence-building measures in the OSC region, we developed an FSC agenda offering a relevant set of topics, concrete questions and pertinent expertise from various participating states and sub-regions of the OSC area. Mr. President, in view of the security dialogues that are held on a weekly basis in the FSC, allow me to shortly elaborate on our program. By the way, you will find paper copies of our chairmanship program outside this meeting room. Our idea was to select a range of topics that we believe have the potential to contribute to a better understanding of the situation seen from different angles, as well as to a better implementation of existing commitments. These topics have been organized into two main clusters. The first cl cluster covers new topic of the political military dimensions, such as private military and security companies, and aspects of modern warfare. Both topics were addressed in the past weeks and have led to interesting discussions, thus giving a ground for further interstate dialogue on the matter. The second cluster covers established topics of the FSC, such as small arms and light weapons and stockpiles of conventional ammunition, the Vienna Document 2011, the Code of Conduct on Political-Military Aspects of Security, 
the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, and finally, regional confidence and security building measures. In the format of joint FSCPC meetings, we address the topics of lessons learned from conflict resolution and of security sector governance and reform. Every week in the FSC, usually in the afternoon, in addition to the security dialogue and under the agenda item general statement, delegations spend at least two hours to discuss the conflict in and around Ukraine in its different theaters, Donbas, Crimea, and Azov and Black Sea. Our military advisors also meet every week in the format of working groups discussing the best ways to implement and complement our tools of confidence and security building measures. To conclude, let me share first impressions uh, and observations as a chair of the FSC. Firstly, the FSC remains a key for us to build and keep trust in the political military domain of the OSCE. Secondly, the FSC, thanks to its security dialogues and working groups, also functions as a platform to share experiences, develop new instruments, and update existing tools. Dedicated discussions on existing and emerging security challenges in the political military sphere are precisely an important step forward, uh, an important step towards more confidence and transparency among all participating states. Thirdly, and this is an observation, the way the debate is conducted on the conflict in and around Ukraine in the FEC, it is absolutely clear that this conflict has now European and even Euro-Atlantic security consequences. This conflict is pivotal for the future of the whole European security architecture. Fourthly, given the currently tense climate in our region, we can't realistically expect immense leaps forward. However, we can and should expect what we can and should expect is working more efficiently with the tools we have at hand, based on a renewed commitment to our principles and a mutual understanding of the benefits deriving from cooperative security. This renewed commitment should also take place on a parliamentary level in order to create a security community for the benefit of everyone. Switzerland hopes to be successful in contributing to an overall process which aims at increasing stability and confidence in Europe. We want to do so by welcoming new ideas and by exploring the potential of, exi of existing initiatives. In the FSC Troika, we work closely with the former FSC Chair Sweden and the succeeding FSC Chair Tajikistan. And we rely, we rely, of course, on the professional support provided by the OSCE Secretariat. We now look for the creation of even more thematic bridges with the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly in the field of the politico-military dimension. We are thankful for all resolutions your Assembly passes that address issues related to this crucial aspect of European, Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian security in the OSC area. I thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup, Ambassador. As uh, next speaker, I welcome Ambassador Lamberto Zagné. He has been OSC High Commissioner on Minorities since July 2017. Before taking up this position, he was OSC Secretary General for two consecutive three-year terms. 
He joined the Italian Foreign Ministry in 1978, and highlights from his extraordinary career include his work at, as head of disarmament, arms control, and cooperative security at NATO from 91 to 97, his role as director of the OSCE Conflict Prevention Center from 2002 to 2006, and his appointment as a UN Special Representative for Kosovo in 2008. Ambassador, it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Alla parola. Grazie, signor Presidente. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to uh, address this uh, parliamentary assembly once, uh, uh, once again. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, highlight some uh, uh, and refer to some concerns I'm having. Uh, uh, from the perspective of my mandate, which is a conflict prevention mandate, uh, focusing on uh, uh, societal divisions and uh, on the um, uh, state of uh, uh, minorities uh, today. Uh, what we see is that the deterioration of the overall uh, uh, security environment uh, in, in the OSC area has a negative impact also on, uh, uh, on minorities and on societies. And there are two angles I would like to, to refer to. Uh, one, the first, is that under the pressure of the uh, external challenges, uh, we see within countries internally uh, stronger trends towards uh, nationalistic tones, uh, str stronger trends towards uh, stressing identity politics. Identity politics go in the direction of uh, uh, questions like who are we, what have we endured together, what is our common history. And moving in that direction, you tend to exclude those who are diverse. And, uh, and to try to uh, uh, regroup around, uh, around these, uh, these central common, uh, common elements, making integration more difficult for, uh, for diversity and creating uh, the potential for tensions within the society. The second aspect is the external one, where the polarization of, uh, of interstate relations uh, results in creating uh, pressure uh, to, to minority groups. Uh, we see more robust policies by so-called king states that look at their uh, um, uh, communities somehow abroad in, in other states uh, as communities that require stronger support from their side. And this is sometimes seen as interference from the country where these communities uh, reside. And in, and in some cases uh, uh, has an impact on, uh, uh, on bilateral relations and fuels uh, uh, the, the uh, instability in, uh, in, in international relations. Uh, sometimes we have the impression uh, that in some cases minorities are even used as pawns on the uh, uh, geopolitical map uh, in a way uh, uh, as, a, as a tool in a way to increase uh, the, the pressure in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, more antagonistic relationship uh, uh, that we see. A third element I would like to refer to is that there has been a strong evolution uh, when, it, when we look at diversity in our, in our societies, also on the, on the notion of minorities. Um, the concept of minority has never been cast in stone, and there isn't a common uh, definition of what, what is a minority. But what we see, what I'm seeing, is that our societies are growing increasingly diverse as a result of many, many factors, uh, from uh, globalization and the impact of globalization to migration. Uh, and and uh, this uh, increasing diversity uh, is uh, um, uh, creating uh, uh, pressures uh, inside the societies that need to be, uh, to be addressed. Now, uh, my mandate, as I say, is a mandate that goes beyond uh, uh, my institution is not necessarily a, a, only a human dimension institution, even though looking at protecting minority rights is very much uh, the center of what, uh, of what we do. Uh, but it's, it's really focused on, uh, on preventing uh, instability, preventing crisis, preventing conflict. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, the method and the objective that we try to pursue through our activities um, uh, is that of creating a balance uh, in the relations within the society, a balance that should go in the general direction of a sustainable integration of the society as, as a whole. Uh, the the uh, basic concept is that diversity is a richness. It should not be seen as a problem. And, and therefore, countries should invest 
in, uh, in making sure that this richness is used for the overall at the advantage of the whole society of the whole country where the uh, where the diversity is, is present um, in this vein uh, my predecessors over the years and I'm continuing their uh, uh, their activity have developed a number of uh, guidelines and recommendations focusing on various aspects of uh, processes of integration there is a a larger one which is called the Ljubljana guidelines that in fact uh, do address integration as a, as a, uh, a comprehensive process. Uh, there is another one, the Bolzano-Bosen recommendations that address interstate relations in the matter of, uh, of minorities, so the minority abroad and, and what is the limit of the third state in, uh, in supporting that minority and what are the responsibilities of the state where the minority resides. But then a number of other uh, sectorial recommendations, beginning with a fundamental uh, sector, which is the sector of education. Uh, education is where uh, a process of sustainable integration starts. And the, uh, uh, the method that we suggest and we promote is that of ensuring that in the, in the, in the process of education, the identity of those who, is, who are diverse is, is as much as possible preserved so that they don't lose their language, and don't lose their culture and the richness of their diversity, but then with the goal of making sure uh, that the education process accompanies uh, uh, this diversity and brings it towards a perfect knowledge of the state language so that the integration can, uh, uh, at the end of the day, result in, a, in enriching uh, the society allowing those who are diverse to become full part of the society and of the country, of the institutions uh, of the country where, where they operate. Um, the issue of participation of minorities in the public life of a country is, is very much uh, uh, crucial in our view. We will have this year, uh, we have a set of recommendations on participation of minorities, which include political participation and political representation of minorities in parliaments, in the institutions, etc. Um, uh, we have uh, recommendations addressing specifically this point. They are called the Lund recommendation, Lund in, in Sweden. Uh, we will have, uh, after the summer in November, uh, we will have a, a, um, uh, an event in Lund, a rather large event, uh, to uh, uh, celebrate the 10th uh, anniversary of these, uh, of these recommendations. And we will have uh, uh, panels on uh, participation of women, uh, Roma, but also on, uh, uh, on the issue of, uh, uh, of participation in public life and in parliaments. So I, I look forward also to having uh, a, a presence and a role for the parliamentary assembly in that, uh, uh, in that context, uh, uh, perhaps with voices bringing exp experiences from various parts of the OSCE region and comparing notes and comparing best, uh, best practices. As I was saying, these uh, uh, guidelines and recommendations are important for me from a number of perspectives. Uh, first of all, they, they are based on best practices, on experiences of my predecessors and then myself now uh, in dealing with uh, specific minority-related uh, situations across uh, the OSC area. Uh, so they, they reflect uh, uh, real-life uh, uh, situations and, and lessons learned. Uh, under those, and they have they've been done in partnership with academic institutions, with institutes of excellence, uh, uh, where we find uh, uh, a long-term expertise on these uh, on these issues. And working and promoting the guidelines, I found uh, 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 allows me to distance myself from this political polarization. Allows me not to take sides, but in a way to come in uh, with a practical advice on how. Uh, every situation can be addressed or, or, or can be improved. Uh, very much, in fact, lies in your hands, because at the basis of what we have is legislations. Uh, legislation on education, legislation on, on use of language. In some other cases, it's, it's a practice. For instance, we have recommendations on multi-ethnic policing, uh, where we see it is important to uh, make sure that as you operate, as police uh, uh, operates in minority areas, there is a representation also of the minority groups within the police, so that the police can be more effective, uh, and at the same time better accepted by uh, uh, the, the communities where, where they operate. Um, I was mentioning gender and I was mentioning um, uh, young people. Uh, 
working on minorities, it's, all, it's always important, and education is also very much related to that, to invest a lot in the, in the new generations, because integration is always a long-term process, a process where you need to invest uh, also on, on, the, uh, on the youth. Uh, recently, we, um, uh, as my office, every uh, couple of years, uh, issues in, in cooperation with the Dutch government, uh, a big award in the name of the founder of the, of the office, the first High Commissioner, Max van der Stoel, uh, the Max van der Stoel Award. This, uh, this year, this last autumn, we uh, 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 awarded uh, this, this prize to a group of students from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, from a small town called Jajce, uh, because they, uh, they went down in the streets and they fought against a program of the authorities to open uh, uh, one of those segregated schools that have become uh, 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 very um, common in, uh, in many places of that, uh, of that country, uh, which reflects still the spirit of the Dayton Agreement, which is that of separating the community to try to ensure stability in the country. But of course, by separating the communities, there is no investment in a common future and there is no investment in, uh, uh, in an integrated, uh, in an integrated and more, more efficient society. So the, the young people saw that and they went in the streets and they demonstrated against this and in the end they prevailed. And now they have a school where they study together. Uh, in this case, uh, um, uh, uh, Bosniak uh, and, and Croat uh, kids. In, in this in the city of uh, of Yaitze. so we called them uh, we called them over uh, and it was also a good mix of uh, uh, boys and girls uh, that had been uh, uh, in the streets and we gave them this award and want to make this a model of uh, uh, how uh, young people can also show the way uh, uh, towards a better uh, uh, and the more stable uh, um, integration of the society. Um, you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, at the beginning mentioned the Goal 16. I will, I will, I will uh, com uh, conclude on this. Um, we, uh, last year, we organized an event in New York on conflict prevention, looking at integration of societies. Conflicts often stem from uh, divisions within the societies. Uh, looking at, uh, at uh, Goal 16 of the uh, SDGs, uh, that will be in New York in, uh, in July, a high-level political forum to review the state of implementation of, uh, uh, of the Sustainable Development Goals. And we will organize an, a, a meeting with a number of regional organizations to support, and the angle is Chapter 8 of the UN Charter, uh, to support the UN and presenting our own experiences and our own uh, expertise and our own tools, as these guidelines, for instance, and showing how these can be used to effectively prevent conflicts also in other, uh, in other areas and uh, showing our uh, 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 readiness to share our own expertise and our own lessons learned also with other uh, regions outside uh, in other parts of the world. Um, I conclude on this and thank you, thank you very much and I look forward to continuing close interaction with the parliamentarians of our countries. Thank you. Grazie mille, Ambasciatore. Uh, we now come uh, to our uh, second debate. Five committee members have asked to speak. I remember that uh, speaking time is limited to two minutes and I start with Mrs. Anat Berko, Israel. Dear Mr. Chair, dear, co dear colleagues, today is a special day for Israel. The Bereshit Genesis in English Moon Lander was successfully launched in the cooperation with NASA. It is a unique national project and once Bereshit lands on the moon, Israel will become the fourth nation reaching the moon. Mr. Chair, as a member of Knesset for the past four years, I dealt intensively with counterterrorism, a field to my, uh, related to my work as a researcher on the Palestinian terror and an officer in the Israeli army. We must distinguish between defending uh, our societies from crime and terror. I would like to mention some examples of legislations that I initiate and passed in our parliament, the Knesset. One, preventing the election of convicted terrorists to the Knesset. 
in a democracy, the right to vote and to be elected is a basic right. But first and foremost, states need to guarantee security to their own citizens. Second, restricting mass funerals of terrorists. These are big demonstrations of power and serves as a recruiting tool for terrorism. Third, minors in terrorists. In our Western view, a minor needs protection. But how do we protect society from children committing terrorist acts like beheading, stabbing, or bombing? According to my law, these young adults will stay in detention between the age of 12 to 14 and will later be assessed. Another legislation, eliminate, elimination of parole committees for security prisoners, terrorists who do, who do not express remorse and do not need rehabilitation, so the orientation should be based on security. I wish to emphasize that these are states that are a, a terrorist entity such as Iran. Iran supports terrorism, uses semi-military terror organizations such as Hezbollah and Shia militias and Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza as proxies. Another, another dilemma that we, democratic countries, including Israel, must address is the return of citizens who joined ISIS to commit atrocities. It should be clarified that joining ISIS is a one-way ticket, entailing and revoking revocation of one's citizenship. This must be legislated and clarified in the international arena. Dear President Chertelli, dear colleagues, this is the last OSCEPA meeting in which I participate as a member of Knesset. I would like to thank you for the interesting exchange of opinions we have had in the last four years and the wonderful spirit of cooperation within the OSCE PA. Thank you and Shalom. Shalom. Thank you very much. Wishing to see you anyhow in further opportunities. The floor is now to Representative Richard Hudson, United States of America. Thank you. <clears throat> it's important, it's more important than ever that the OSCE worked to increase, increase cooperation and military transparency across the region. Let me take the opportunity to address an issue in the headlines in this area. The United States is committed to arms control efforts that advance collective security, are verifiable and enforceable, and crucially includes partners that comply responsibly with their obligations. Further progress is difficult to envision, however, in an environment that is characterized by continuing significant non-compliance with existing arms control obligations and commitments by participating states who seek to change borders and overturn existing norms. The Russian government continues to violate a range of arms control treaties and commitments that pertain to our discussion today. In the nuclear context, the most significant Russian violation involves a system banned by the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Signed in 1987, the INF Treaty prohibits the United States and Russia from possessing ground-launched ballistic and cruise missiles with ranges between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. In the early years of this historic treaty, both sides collectively destroyed more than 2,600 missiles. Unfortunately, we must now confront the fact that the Russian government has been cheating on this historic treaty, producing, flight testing, and fielding exactly the types of missiles the INF Treaty prohibits. As a result of Russia's actions, the United States notified Russia that it was suspending its obligations under the treaty. Let me note that all NATO allies strongly supported the United States' decision to find Russia in material breach of the INF Treaty for its production of fielding of the 9M729. The United States also announced that it will withdraw from the treaty in six months in accordance with the treaty's terms. The United States retains the right to revoke its notice of withdrawal from the treaty before the end of this six-month period, and we would be prepared to consider doing so should Russia return to full and verifiable compliance. Let me be clear. 
an INF treaty with which all parties comply contributes to global stability. An arms control treaty that one side violates is no longer effective at keeping the world safer. Only the verifiable destruction of all 9M729 missiles, launchers, and associated support equipment would allow Russia to return to compliance. In light of our six-month notice of withdrawal, the Russian government has one last chance to save the INF Treaty by returning to full and verifiable compliance. We hope and pray Russia will reconsider the path that they're on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Gaspardin Nikolai Rizak, Russia Federation. Уважаемые председатели, уважаемые коллеги, мир действительно подошел к очень опасной черте. На наших с вами глазах происходит разрушение системы безопасности, которая создавалась десятилетиями. Это касается и договора по обычным вооружениям, это касается договора по противоракетной обороне, это касается договора по РСД, РНД. Под угрозой и стратегический договор СНВ-3, чего нельзя ни в коем случае допускать. Мы сегодня отмечаем, к сожалению, пятилетие со дня государственного переворота на Украине. Мы отмечаем это тем, что проявление и героизация нацизма стало реальным фактором. Дорастает целое поколение, которое уже не мыслит себя как шествие, которое наподобие гитлеровских фашистских молодчих в Германии. Мы отдаем себе отчет какой потенциал вырастает. А теперь давайте скажем, кто что-то все-таки внес решающий факт в победу над ИГИЛ? Вот сейчас мы проводим гуманные, гуманитарные операции. Есть ли реакция сейчас мирового сообщества по оказанию и искоренению начатков, источников ИГИЛ в мире? Никто практически не оказывает действенной помощи. Я думаю, что есть и другие моменты, на которые мы должны обращать внимание. Мы считаем, что главным политическим итогом прошлого года – это принятие на 73-й Ассамблее, Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН, резолюции по международной информационной безопасности. К сожалению, натовские государства и ЕС не поддержали, хотя в целом мировое сообщество откликнулось, и 120 государств поддержали. Вносим предложение обсудить этот вопрос на специальном заседании ОБСЕ. Это очень важный вопрос. И не могу не ответить на реплику американских коллег. Это единственная страна, где на законодательном уровне узаконено право изменять режимы. Если господин Уикер ставит под сомнение легитимность избрания собственного президента, нам остается только сожалеть. А вот то, что происходит в Венесуэле, это реальный факт, который говорит о действительных намерениях и поступках этой, в общем-то, великой исторической страны. Это вызывает огромное сожаление. Благодарю за внимание. Спасибо большое. Next speaker, Mr. Sergei Vizotsky, Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ch Chairman. Thank you, dear colleagues. Well, I always thought that Nazism and Nazism and fascism is to violate all international principles, is to be empirical, is to go to other countries, occupy it and annex it because of uh, uh, some historical privilege that Nazi regimes and fascist regimes uh, think are right. So uh, let us all decide who in this room are capable of compelling with such a Nazi and fascist standards. I don't think that it will be Ukraine. Our Russian colleagues try to to represent themselves as a counter-terrorist state that trying to uh, trying to fight terrorism uh, in the world. Uh, I would like to stress that what we see now and this transformation of uh, international proxy aggression, hybrid aggression that our Russian, Russians are using in the world is connected uh, to uh, the private military companies uh, and to the activities when some private military companies, some, uh, um, some non-governmental bodies uh, are used as a tool uh, for promoting and expanding uh, the state empirical Russian 
Russian interests and Russian aggression. We're speaking about so-called Wagner private military companies, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, hosted by so-called Kremlin cook Evgeny Prigozhin and other activities. What we saw in the Azov Sea and the Kerch Strait? In fact, we saw the attack on Ukrainian ships in the international waters by FSB and border control of Russia. In fact, we saw that it was a uh, uh, act of piracy. Uh, if Russians are using the private military companies to provoke crises in Balkans, at Syria, uh, if uh, these parliamentary, parliamentary uh, companies are fighting in Ukraine, I want to ask if we saw an uh, act of piracy in the international waters, what could be next? Should we or will we see some kind of pirate ships that will block some of the NATO ports, the ports of the other countries? Will we see the end of maritime security? It's the thing that we must uh, ask ourselves here in the first committee. Uh, the crisis in Azov must be resolved with sanctions. And we call all of the participant, participant states, all of the OC states, to sanction the Russian aggression in the Azov Sea and to release our salesmen. Thank you. Дякую. Next speaker and last for this debate, Mr. Yurakon Matizoda, Tajikistan. Спасибо. Уважаемые коллеги, хочу заострить ваше внимание на вопросе сотрудничества по противодействию деятельности представителей террористических и экстремистских организаций, запрещенных в нашей стране, но преступно действующей с территории европейских стран. Ныне в Таджикистане, в моей родине, серьезно обеспокоен вызывает объявление незаконной партии исламского возрождения, которая признана Верховным судом Таджикистана террористической организацией, и ее деятельность запрещена на территории республики. 9 сентября 2018 года разыскивают так называемые террористы, в бегах города Варшавы подписали декларацию об образовании совместного преступного объединения «Национальный альянс» в Таджикистане. В данный альянс вошли террористические и экстремистские группы, члены которых объявлены Таджикистаном международный роз через международные организации «Интерполом», возглавляемые руководителем террористической организации партии «Исламского возрождения» Мухидином Кабири. Трагические события последнего времени прошлого года – со всей ясности показывает, что радикальные террористические силы не отступали от своих деструктивных замыслов и продолжают наращивать свои разрушительный потенциал в нашей регионе. Очевидно тому, что свидетельство вооружения нападения террористов на иностранных туристов в конце июля прошлого года на юге Таджикистана, ответственность которой возложена на запрещенную к террористической организацию партии «Исламского возрождения». Не следует забывать, что это было первым ужасающим нападением в стране, когда террористы преднамеренно искали иностранцев, чтобы объявленным в Таджикистане годом развития туризма получить максимальный резонанс и снизить имя Таджикистана на мировой арене. В этой связи мы должны признать актуальность вопроса взаимного уважения решений, принимаемых сторонами по задержанию и выдаче преступников для привлечения их к уголовной ответственности. Наличие вашего тесного взаимодействия и постоянной консультации соответствующих сторон. Хочу еще раз напомнить о корыстных и закулисных целях и планах Альянса прокровителей, которые являются экстремистами и террористами. Спасибо. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to our special debate, seventh item on our agenda, resolving protracted conflicts, the tools and mechanisms of OSCE. It is my pleasure to welcome for the introduction to this debate Mr. Charles Lonsdale and Monsieur Paul Picard from OSCE Conflict Prevention Center, who will introduce the debate for us. Mr. Lonsdale has been Deputy Director for Policy Support Services at the CPC since 2015 and was previously British Ambassador to Armenia and Deputy Head of the British Delegation to OSCE. Mr. Lonsdale, you have the floor. 
if I may, actually, I would suggest that my colleague uh, Paul Picard uh, speaks first, since he will set the, the stage with the full set of toolboxes, and then I would speak about some of the, the specific conflicts. So, with your permission, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, um, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure uh, for us uh, to be here today to represent the Conflict Prevention Center in this important session and giving us an opportunity to speak about the OSC's Conflict Cycle Toolbox, which includes tools for resolving protracted conflicts. Today, we face a, a complex web of diverse and overlapping security challenges. We are confronted with a highly dynamic and increasingly uncertain geopolitical environment Crises have become common and the risk of conflict is growing. This means we need a diverse set of tools and the flexibility to adapt them to evolving situations. Since the adoption of Ministerial Council decision number 311 on elements of the conflict cycle about eight years ago, we have invested considerable efforts in developing our toolbox in order to address the different phases of the conflict cycle. These efforts have been focused, among others, on implementing a more systematic and structured approach to collecting, analyzing, and communi communicating early warning signals so as to prepare the ground for appropriate preventive action and early response. The Conflict Prevention Center has a specific role to play in that regard. Having been assigned through MC Decision 311, the function of OSC-wide early warning focal point. In this regard, the CPC provides early warning related analysis to the Secretary General and the Chairmanship. To maintain constant situational awareness, our Situation Room monitors development around the clock throughout the OSC area and beyond. The Situation Room's 24-7 monitoring of open source information is a critically important element of our early warning system and includes the tracking of pertinent developments related to protracted conflict in the OSC area. Another responsibility of the CPC relates to the coordination of an OSC-wide network of early warning focal points, which brings together staff and mission members from OSC executive structures. The network is a key element for sharing information and expertise, including on topics beyond early warning, such as dialogue facilitation, mediation, or crisis management, and peace building. Today we have heard from our distinguished speakers, and uh, um, especially from high, our High Commissioner, the fact that he has a mandate of conflict prevention and early warning. And HCNM, the institution, is part of this early warning network, and the, the contribution of the HCNM is extremely valuable. Like, likewise, the Secretariat of the Parliamentary Assembly is also represented in the network with Francesco Pagani as the early warning focal point. And we are very grateful for Francesco and also the OSCPA through him for his great cooperation and extremely valuable contribution to the network. The PA's presence in the network is crucial to ensuring that the PA's capacities to address the different phases of the conflict are properly integrated within OSC's overall toolbox. <coughs> Excuse me. As a primary instrument for conflict prevention and peaceful conflict resolution, the OSC has a long-standing and distinguished history of activities that promote inter-community dialogue, be it through the work of the CPC, the field operations, or the institutions. These activities include our efforts to address protracted conflicts. Supporting the peaceful resolution of conflicts through mediation and dialogue facilitation has been and remains at the heart of the OSC's overall mandate as a regional security arrangement under Chapter 8 of the UN Charter. In that regard, the CPC's mediation support team is among our strongest assets. In line with Ministerial Council Decision 311, the CPC is the OSC-wide focal point for mediation support, and the mediation support team is available to assist all members of the OSC family, including participating states, thereby helping strengthen capacities for peaceful conflict resolution, both on the ground and at the strategic level. 
in recent years, the OSC Parliamentary Assembly has invested considerable effort in enhancing in its own capacities to implement and support mediation and dialogue facilitation activities. This has grown out of the increase in attention being paid to mediation and di dialogue facilitation. And <clears throat> This is illustrated by the resolution on the development of mediation capacity in the OSC area adopted at the PA's 2014 annual session and the follow-up resolution adopted in 2016. Also in 2016, the PA appointed a special representative on mediation. In line with its endeavors to strengthen its mediation capacities, the PA has sought the support of the CPC's mediation support team. The MST organized a mediation brainstorming for the PA president, its vice presidents, the secretary general, and the PA secretariat staff in May 2016, which was followed by mediation and dialogue facilitation training in April of 2017. The CPC stands ready to continue cooperating closely with the PA in this critical area. Finally, with regard to conflict resolution, I would like to draw your attention to the need for gender-sensitive approaches. This important topic has been highlighted by all my distinguished colleagues here at the table who uh, took the floor during this session. It has been widely demonstrated that the meaningful participation of women in peace processes strengthens the legit legitimacy of process and increases the likelihood of lasting solutions. Therefore, we must do and uh, more to ensure that women participate meaningfully in every phase of the conflict cycle, including, including in resolving protracted conflicts in the OSC area. With this, I turn the floor to my colleague Charles Lonsday. Thank you, Paul. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I join Paul in thanking you for the opportunity to discuss with you the OSC's work on protracted conflicts, or perhaps even more neutrally, unresolved conflicts. I'd like to give you a very brief oversight of the ongoing activity in addressing a range of conflicts in the OSC area. This remains a priority for the organization as a whole. I think you heard yesterday from the chairperson in office, Minister Lajczak, as he underlined the importance of addressing conflict issues and his commitment to do so through the Slovak chairmanship's strong support for the existing formats. I should perhaps be careful to distinguish between those formats and the work of the OSC Secretariat, as well as, of course, the work of the institutions and the Parliamentary Assembly. The formats themselves are primarily a matter for the parties and for the representatives or facilitators, in most cases appointed by the chairperson in office. The Secretariat and the Conflict Prevention Center is, of course, fully committed to supporting those formats in line with their and our mandates. but. I won't pretend to speak for the various facilitators or representatives, or indeed to comment in detail on the status of discussions in the formats themselves. I'd also just make a couple of general observations. First, each of the situations we deal with is unique. The principles, the commitments engaged are the same, but the formats are very different, and that's ultimately a matter for the parties to them. That's not to say we can't take inspiration from the approaches to other conflicts within the OSC area or further afield, but I would just be wary of making direct comparisons between different processes underway. Secondly, we also need to be clear on the distinct mandates of the various existing formats, which may cover conflict resolution as such, but, for example, in the case of the Geneva International Discussions, are mandated to address security and humanitarian issues, but not to produce a final settlement. And peace processes, in many cases, are very extended. They need careful and patient work on issues related to the conflict, but perhaps not directly addressing root causes before the sides can move towards a final settlement. If I turn now to the various conflicts in which the OSC is engaged, I don't want to suggest that Ukraine should be parceled together with unresolved conflicts from earlier years, but it remains a main focus and a test for the OSC and for our conflict work. And it occupies much effort and capacity on the part of the organization. This includes the leading role of the OSC through the special monitoring mission on the ground and through the trilateral contact group in Minsk and its working groups on security, political, humanitarian and economic issues with the key role of the special representative, Ambassador Martin Seidig. We should also keep in mind the work of the OSC project coordinator in Ukraine and his team and the border observation mission at the Russian checkpoints Gukova and Donetsk. 
Over the last couple of years, we've welcomed real progress being made in the Transnistrian settlement process with the intensive involvement of the OSC mission to Moldova and the special representatives of successive OSC chairpersons in office, currently Franco Frattini, and in close coordination with international partners through the 5 plus 2 mechanism. Agreement of a ministerial statement in Milan was another indication of the very active process and this should continue the successful result-oriented approach that has been pursued in recent years and build on existing agreements as a solid basis for further concrete steps working towards a comprehensive, peaceful and sustainable settlement. We are also very closely involved in supporting the Geneva International Discussions dealing with the consequences of the 2008 war in Georgia and the Chair and Office's Special Representative for the South Caucasus, Ambassador Rudy Mikalka in his role as co-chair of the Geneva International Discussions, the GID, with the EU and UN, and as co-facilitator of meetings of the Incident Prevention and Response Mechanism, the IPRM, in Egneti. Uh, the CPC, in fact myself, also co-moderate the GID's Working Group 2 on humanitarian issues. And we also implement several confidence-building measures in support of these discussions, such as the continued expert support to the dis investigation of missing persons and a summer school for young people from conflict-affected communities. As the co-chairs noted at the 10th anniversary of the GID last October, discussions have contributed to improve stability and accountability on the ground, including through the IPRMs and through hotlines, which enable local security actors to address incidents on the ground. But core issues on the agenda remain to be resolved, including efforts to agree a joint statement on non-use of force and to work towards steps to implement that commitment and challenges also remain regarding the needs and rights of conflict-affected communities. Some positive steps have been undertaken, but much needs still to be done. Unfortunately, substantial discussions on IDPs and refugees have not been possible in recent years due to repeated walkouts by some participants. We follow developments in the nagorno karabakh conflict dealt with by the Minsk Group with great interest and more recently with some hope for a positive dynamic following the regular meetings of foreign ministers and the informal meetings between President Aliyev and Prime Minister Pashinyan. And we also support the work of the personal representative of the CIO, Ambassador Andrzej Kaspacik. We note the commitment to concrete measures to prepare populations for peace and we stand ready to support that if the parties are interested. But we are not directly involved in the work of the Minsk Group co-chairs, so I won't comment in more detail on the status of, of those discussions. As I conclude, I might note that many of our field operations, while not dealing with protracted conflicts as such, have their origins in periods of instability or conflict. Their mandates and activities have evolved greatly over the years, but may still include conflict-related elements. Uh, for example, in Southeast Europe, in the ongoing work of our field operations to address reconciliation and very practical work to address the lingering consequences of conflict. For example, the regional housing program, which we support with UNHCR, which provides housing for the most vulnerable displaced persons in the region through our partner countries. Paul mentioned the importance of gender-sensitive approaches, and this is something uh, that I should note we do pursue actively in practice. For example, uh, the last session of the Geneva International Discussions, we arranged an information session for participants on women, peace, and security issues. I will conclude here, but we look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Monsieur Picard, Mr. Lonsdale, for giving us an overview of OSCE tools and mechanisms to resolve protracted conflicts or unresolved conflicts. A new interesting definition. Colleagues, let us now discuss the issue. I am certain that our distinguished speakers from the CPC are looking forward to hearing your perspectives and they will at the end have the possibility uh, to answer as well as the other speakers and ambassadors who are here. We will take all the speakers now and at the end have a, a round of answers from, uh, from this uh, uh, table. Now for this debate, 22 committee members have asked to speak. I remember that the speaking time is limited to two minutes for each uh, uh, speech. And I call first Mr. Kostel Nikolai, Ms. Mr. Kostel Nikolai Dunava, Romania. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
distinguished colleagues, if we look at the conflict resolution as a core task of the OACE, then the status quo is neither acceptable nor sustainable. Uh, Romania favors a conflict prevention approach rather than a conflict resolution only, including a closer coordination within the OSCE and a closer coordination between various international organizations. After almost 30 years, conflicts in the OSCE region were not solved. Uh, additional conflicts emerge, and all these have negative effects in terms of credibility and trust both of parts to the conflict and the affected population. Uh, this situation represents a clear indi indicator of the importance of strengthening the toolbox in the field of peaceful uh, settlement of conflicts at global, as well as regional, national and even local levels, but at the same time we have and can make a better use of the existing ones. Dear colleagues, uh, the resolutions of the conflict in the Republic of Moldova remains a matter of high priority for Romania. We reiterate our strong support for a comprehensive, peaceful and sustainable settlement of the conflict based on the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Republic of Moldova uh, within its internationally recognized borders. We stress that the 5 plus 2 format remains the only one that guarantees the legitimacy and transparency for a lasting solution in the settlement process. We reiterate the importance of the full implementation by both sides of the commitments undertaken. We recall that the UNGA resolution adopted on 22 June 2018 urges the Russian Federation to complete unconditionally and without further delay the orderly withdrawal of the operational group of Russian forces and its armaments from the territory of the Republic of Moldova. Under this, uh, the last successive OSCE's chairmanships, some specific social, economic and administrative measures included in the so-called package of eight have been agreed. Our attention will now have to focus on the implementation of the reached agreements, including that concerning the long-standing issue of a normal functioning of the Latin script schools in the region of Transnistria. Thank you. You're welcome. The floor is to Gaspadin Gennady Onyshenka, Rosyska Federacja. Спасибо, господин председательствующий. 11 сентября 2001 года американский народ столкнулся с великой трагедией, которая наблюдалась с болью весь мир, это не заживающая рана в душе американского народа. Но я хотел бы напомнить о том, что 18 сентября спецслужбы Соединенных Штатов Америки применили боевую рецептуру биологического оружия Штайм Эймс сибирской язвы против собственного народа для того, чтобы получить право войти в Афганистан, пролета над российской территорией, военных самолетов и так далее, и так далее. Учитывая те конфликты, которые сегодня происходят на территории нашего континента и которые активно модерируются американскими спецслужбами, я еще раз хочу подчеркнуть важность того, что Соединенные Штаты Америки не соблюдают конвенцию по биологическому и токсинному оружию, что они сегодня модерируют эти конфликты, и я не исключаю, что несоблюдение этого важнейшего документа, который принимал весь мир, может резко осложнить ту ситуацию, которая происходит на территории нашего континента. Поэтому я еще раз призываю нашу политическую структуру, несмотря на то, что есть специальный механизм контроля за КБТО, взять этот вопрос под контроль, попросить наших американских коллег рассказать, что делается для того, чтобы не было производства биологического оружия на территории нашего континента, а для этого созданы все условия, вот, и попросить э, очень серьезно отнестись к этому вопросу. Благодарю вас. Спасибо. Хер Национал Рад Андреас Эби, Швейц. Der Vorsitzende hat die Neuen begrüßt. Ich bin bald zehn Jahre in dieser 
Parlamentarischen Versammlung Opfer geworden und denke an die nächste und übernächste Generation. Die Welt ist nicht besser, das haben wir heute alle gesehen, sondern viel schlechter geworden. Ob schon wir alle, das glauben wir wenigstens, intelligenter, vernetzter und erfahrener sind. 2019, fast 30 Jahre nach dem Ende des Kalten Krieges, zähle ich im OSZE-Raum mindestens einen offenen und vier bewaffnete, eingefrorene Konflikte. Das sind fünf Konflikte zu viel, Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Dass Fortschritte möglich sind, beobachten wir aktuell in Moldova. Nach jahrelangen Verhandlungen sind vor einigen Monaten pragmatische Schritte festgestellt worden, die in klar definierten Fristen umgesetzt werden sollen. Das ist sehr positiv. Und ich möchte allen involvierten Parteien, darunter der OSZT, zu diesen Fortschritten gratulieren. Die OSZT spielt in Georgien, in Nagorno-Karabach und in der Ukraine ebenfalls eine wichtige Rolle. Auch in diesen sehr unterschiedlichen Konflikten arbeitet sie darauf hin, dass die Bedingungen für eine friedliche politische Lösung geschaffen werden. Auch hierzu braucht sie unsere Unterstützung. In der Ukraine ist die humanitäre Situation im Konfliktgebiet weiterhin sehr schlecht. An der Kontaktlinie gibt es regelmäßig Opfer zu beklagen und die zivile Infrastruktur wird immer wieder durch Kriegshandlungen beschädigt. Deshalb ist es zentral, dass die Special Monitoring Mission ihr Mandat vollumfänglich ausüben kann. Dass die Beobachter immer noch keinen vollen Zugang zum gesamten Konfliktgebiet haben und dass ihre Drohnen regelmäßig funktionsunfähig gemacht werden, kann nicht weiter toleriert werden. Auch die trilaterale Kontaktgruppe muss ihre Arbeit so machen können, dass Fortschritte bei der Konfliktlösung möglich sind. Die Fortschritte in Moldova zeigen auch auf, dass man in der OSZT-Region weiterhin fähig ist, den politischen Willen aufzubringen und bei der Konfliktlösung wichtige Schritte zu erzielen. Diesen politischen Willen braucht es dringend in den anderen Konflikten. Der Ball ist somit auch bei uns. Wir müssen dazu beitragen, den Willen zur Zusammenarbeit und zu politischen Lösungen zu kreieren. Denn auch die beste OSZT ist nur so stark wie ihre Teilnehmerstaaten. Danke sehr. Mrs. Maria Karapetian, Armenia. Mr. Chairperson, Excellencies, dear colleagues, um, I've been to the OSCE previously as a member of the civil society uh, of Armenia, and my motivation has always been the peaceful resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. After the Velvet Revolution and the December elections in Armenia, my capacity has changed, but my motivation stays the same. Uh, prior to talking about tools and mechanisms of the OSCE for the resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, I have to stress um, what is the basic environment we need for these tools and mechanisms to be effective. Uh, it's the maintenance of the ceasefire, the non-use of uh, force and its threat, and the absence of militarist rhetoric. Provided we have these, and in the past few months, the leaderships of our countries have been able to achieve, to a certain extent, a betterment of the situation, uh, we can then look onto the tools and mechanisms. To make sure that this uh, basic environment is not fragile, we need the incident prevention and response mechanism in our region uh, to avoid escalations and to ensure sustainable livelihoods for the population in our region. A second thing we need is to inform our societies of the logic and content uh, and transparency and accountability of the negotiations. Uh, we need to avoid discriminatory language, hate speech and enemy images in the public and political discourses as well as in media and educational environments. Um, for past decades, Armenia has faced a dilemma whether it can consolidate its democracy while it's facing a conflict in its region. And um, I want to congratulate my people on proving that this dilemma is solvable in favor for consolidating democracy and not compromising human rights. And my final po point is on the inclusivity in the conflict uh, resolution and transformation process. Me and my colleagues here can speak on behalf of the citizens of Armenia that have elected us as officials, but we cannot represent the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. In order for this process to be truly inclusive and to, for us to achieve commitments that can be sustained by all societies, we do need to include the voices of the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. So that we can reach a solution that's acceptable for all parties and sustainable. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Next speaker, our Vice President Azai Guliev, Azerbaijan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, dear friends, uh, 
Nineties, we have been witnessing the, some positive signals in the process of establishing high-level dialogue between Armenia and Azerbaijan for the last three months. It gives a sort of cautious optimism for result-oriented negotiations. Of course, I also welcome the recent statement made by OEC co-chairs on the need to prepare the people of Azerbaijan and Armenia to the peace. I think it is possible. However, given the long-standing conflicts, I think several important steps need to be done for building some conditions or confidence between our conflicting parties. What can be done? We can start the easiest ones. For example, a few months ago, Azerbaijan has initiated to exchange of hostages and war prisoners from Armenia and Azerbaijan based on all for all principles uh, registered by International Red Cross Organization. I do believe that it could serve as a starting point in the way of resolution, the complicated issues. As a response to my Armenian colleague having the uh, contact between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, community of Nakorni Karabakh, I say it would be great if we could uh, have organized such a meeting between communities which really could be useful in terms of identifying the legal final legal status of Nakorni Karabakh region. I do hope that Armenian delegation will support these two very timely and promising proposals. And also, I do think that we have to be ready for difficult stage of the negotiations, which is about the changing status quo, which has been demanded from the president of co-chair countries for about three years. I think the change in status quo implies gradually the occupation of the Azerbaijani seven districts by Armenia, which have nothing to do or in common with Nakorni Karabakh. I hope that our two ministers of foreign affairs are keen to solve this conflict within the format of matter principles that fully support this step-by-step -step approach. Since we are talking about the need of preparing both people to peace, I think if we can't do something positive things, at least we stop doing something negative. This is why I call on Armenian leadership at least to stop all type of illegal economic activities and use of natural resources in occupied territories of Azerbaijan. Also to stop illegal military exercise and illegal resettlement of refugees from Syria and also of course altering cultural and historical heritage of Azerbaijan. There are the important things that needed to be done for proving political will to resolve Armenia Azerbaijan the Kony Karabakh conflict by peaceful means and prepare our peoples to sustainable and long lasting peace. Thank you Mr Chair. Thank you, Azai. Next speaker, Mr. Sergei Sirbu from Moldova. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues. The Moldovan authorities recognize the valuable contribution of the OCPA in fostering peace, security, and democracy in the OOC area. At the same time, we share the concerns regarding the increasing number of problems our organization is facing today and that should be addressed, particularly the settlement of the protracted conflicts in the OOC area, which have been wrangling over for a long time. Dear colleagues, in the following, I would like to refer to the Transnistrian conflict and the foreign military presence on the territory of the Republic of Moldova, two major and well-known security problems that may country that my country has been facing for many years. As you know, the Moldovan authorities have focused on solving the daily problems facing the population in the conflict zone, particularly regarding their right to education, property, freedom of movement, etc. We are firmly convinced that these confidence building measures in the context of small step policy and support for the people contribute effectively uh, to the rapprochement between the two banks of Nistru River and to creating a conductive atmosphere for the negotiation process on the final settlement of the conflict. I'd like to use this opportunity to underline the importance of the constructive approach of all actors involved in the settlement process that will pave the way to the main objective of a 5 plus 2 format, to attend the comprehensive, peaceful and sustainable settlement on the Transnistrian conflict based on the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Republic of Moldova within its internationally recognized borders with a special status for Transnistrian region. At the same time, we remain committed to the objective on the resumption of the withdrawal of Russian forces and ammunition from the territory of our country as uh, was endorsed by United Nations resolution on complete and unconditional withdrawing of foreign military forces from the territory of the Republic 
Republic of Moldova. We call for initiation of a transparent and substantive dialogue on the transformation of the existing peacekeeping operation on the bank of Nistru River into a multinational civilian mission under the relevant international mandate. We are convinced that acting in such manner we can contribute effectively on the elimination of some serious security threats on our region, given particularly uh, the major environment and humanitarian risk posed by Kobasna munition stockpiles and, impl and um, implicitly to contribute to building confidence between all parties involved in transition settlement process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Mrs. Margareta Sederfeld from Sweden. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, colleague parliamentarians. I want uh, to direct your attention to the ongoing humanitarian crisis in the Russian occupied territories of, in eastern Ukraine. The attempted annexation of Crimea is a clearing violation of international law and agreements signed by the Russian Federation. Furthermore, in its wake has followed gross human rights violations. As recognized by this assembly in the Berlin Declaration, we see in Crimea not only the collapse of society and economy due to war, but also ethnic persecution, including terror, abdication, and killing. We see Ukrainian citizens being abused and held in Russia as an increasing oppression of religious minorities. We see international agencies, media, and human rights offenders, protectors of the Crimean civilization uh, population being bared from the occupied territories. The responsibility for these crimes against the people of Crimea lies with the Russian Federation as the occupying power. OSCE is a key player in restoring peace in Crimea. The OSCE PA must continue to call for an end on the Russian aggression. We have to demand the Russian Federation's adherence to its obligations under the international laws. We all endorse and uphold the human rights of people in the occupied territories. Mr. Chairman, we cannot accept that Eastern Ukraine becomes a frozen conflict. The illegal occupation have to end and the situation of the civilian population be relieved. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next speaker is Mr. Boymaton Razulov from Uzbekistan. Спасибо, господин председатель. Уважаемые коллеги, Республика Узбекистан, как один из центральноазиатских государств, в силу своего геополитического положения рассматривает вопросы политического и социально-экономического развития страны в совокупности с интересом всего региона. Как отметил президент Узбекистана Шавкат Мерзеев, у нас общие вызовы, и мы осознаем нашу совместную ответственность в противодействии экстремизму, терроризму, организованной преступности и другим трансграничным угрозам миру и стабильности. Отрядно отметить, что всего за пару лет ситуация в Центральноазиатском регионе значительно улучшилась, укрепилось взаимное доверие, снизился конфликтный потенциал. Решаются накопившиеся за десятилетия острые и чувствительные проблемы, такие как трансграничное водопользование, безопасность границ. При этом, при этом в регионе остается ряд проблемных вопросов. К примеру, все еще главным дестабилизирующим фактором в регионе является наличие афганского кризиса. Следует отметить, что Узбекистан Афганистану оказывает практическую помощь в восстановлении ее социально-экономической инфраструктуры, рассматривая эти меры в качестве важного фактора в рамках общих усилий по урегулированию ситуации в стране. Например, осуществляются проекты строительства железной дороги мазар шариф герат линии электропередачи сурхан поли хумры а также другие проекты в торгово-экономическом и культурно-гуманитарном сферах. Результаты предпринятых в течение более трех десятилетий усилий Мирового сообщества убедительно свидетельствует о том, что военного решения афганской проблемы нет. Единственный путь к миру в этой стране – это прямой диалог под эгидией ООН между правительством и основными политическими силами. Также важно расширить усилия международного сообщества по эффективному противодействию таким последствиям афганского конфликта, как терроризм, экстремизм, организованная преступность, незаконное производство и торговля наркотиками. Но для этого необходима координация усилий и взаимная поддержка мирового сообщества, в том числе парламентов стран ОБСЕ. Спасибо за внимание.
Thank you very much. Next speaker, Mrs. Irene Haralambides, Cyprus. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. We know by fact that most conflicts reside in violations of international law and human rights. They are a consequence of third parties' aims and of foreign interference in states' internal affairs in the name of fighting terrorism or protecting human rights. From Venezuela through the OSC region to the Middle East, the international legal order is severely challenged. Conflicts persist due to double standards and sanctions imposed selectively. Let's take as an example my country, Cyprus. Yesterday, Vice President Wicker stressed the need for negotiations to resume immediately. The international community, namely the five permanent members of the UN Security Council and the European Union, must exert their influence in this direction. We seek a settlement in accordance with the UN Secretary General's framework, a settlement providing for bizonal, bicommunal federation with a single sovereign citizenship and international personality to the benefit of all Cypriots, Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots. That will set a positive example for the region in its search for peace and stability. A great responsibility to uphold global security and stability lies with the great powers. Russia and USA. The arbitrary decision of, of the US to withdraw from the INF Treaty allowing for Russia to follow suit and for both powers to repeat themselves once again leave the world perplexed. It is my strong hope and that of all people who want global peace that the Cold War era be not revived due to these acts a development which, in light of today's extremely vi uh, volatile security environment, will have disastrous consequences on humanity. Populism, populism widens the political divide in Europe and hinders efforts towards a comprehensive co common European asylum system at the expense of frontline countries. In 2018, Cyprus ranked first among EU member states in asylum applicants relative, uh, relative to its population. My own country, which suffered a huge impact due to the economic crisis, a haircut of bank depositors, and the overnight demolition of its economic model embraced desperate refugees beyond its asylum and reception system capacity. It is thus unthinkable and outrageous that U.S. administration has turned the building of a border wall with Mexico costing five billion into his migration into its migration policy priority to the point of provoking a shutdown of the country's administration. Thank you, Mr. President. Per l'Italia ha chiesto la parola il senatore Gianluca Ferrara ne ha facoltà. Grazie, signor Presidente. Il settimanale tedesco Der Spiegel ha pubblicato una lettera privata del segretario degli esteri del Regno Unito, Jeremy Hunt, al ministro degli esteri tedesco Eiko Maas, in cui chiede di eliminare il divieto di Berlino per l'esportazione di armi verso l'Arabia Saudita, temendo che danneggerà i produttori di armi britannici ed europei per gli innumerevoli progetti comuni in corso. Colleghi, io credo che questa lettera rappresenti una grave ma ennesima contraddizione. In questo modo la nostra opinione pubblica si dice che se un governo è molto facoltoso, come nel caso di quello saudita, può anche violare i diritti umani, mentre in altre parti del mondo le nostre organizzazioni, gli Stati che ognuno di noi rappresenta, reputano il rispetto dei diritti umani come una linea invalicabile. Una linea che, se superata, in passato ha determinato sanzioni e a volte anche inopportuni interventi militari. Nel caso saudita non si indigna, anzi un ministro di un paese in prima fila nella difesa dei diritti umani, purtroppo anche con le bombe, chiede di togliere i divieti e vendere come se nulla fosse. 
Oggi il mondo è multipolare, i cittadini si informano e giudicano se un'azione è coerente con un principio e danno fiducia alle organizzazioni transnazionali anche su questo. Non ci sono più i blocchi della guerra fredda, la storia non è finita come suggeriva qualcuno un po' di anni fa e il mondo è un pullulare di organizzazioni regionali in transizione verso il multipolarismo dove bisogna essere convincenti e non minacciosi. Oggi non c'è alcun dubbio che dietro l'omicidio Casoggi sia implicata la famiglia reale e che ancora più grave in Yemen sia in corso una mattanza che uccide civili di fame e malattie oltre che con le bombe. Colleghi, io ho presentato un disegno di legge che rafforza la possibilità al Governo di sospendere la vendita di armi se un Paese non rispetta i diritti umani o si trova in stato di conflitto armato. Mi auguro che ognuno di voi nel proprio Paese vorrà dire la sua per convincere i sauditi a interrompere la carneficina nei confronti del popolo yemenita e avere giustizia per Jamal Kasoggi. Grazie. Grazie senatore. Dr. Hedy Free, Canada. Thank you very much, Chair. I, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the gender aspects of conflict and all aspects, whether it's conflict prevention, whether it's a conflict resolution, or whether it's post-conflict redevelopment, and the role of women in this. And I think we know that in 2017, the OSCE second review of gender spoke very much and focused very much on this. I was really disappointed, therefore, to hear that some of the permanent representatives who spoke to this issue did not mention gender at all, and that the, the conflict prevention center were the ones who mentioned it. And of course, uh, Alan Farrell, who is a rapporteur for the First Committee, spoke very strongly about this. I think if we're going to look at the role of women in this issue, we will see that if we use data, objective analysis data, we will find that in fact where women are involved in all aspects of conflict prevention, that in fact there is a 35% chance of a 15 year um, pr protracted peace and therefore we need to involve women. But secondly, one of the most important things I think we need to talk about is how we discuss this issue without rhetoric and without emotion. Conflict prevention is really important. Women are are affected by conflict very differently than men, and I think we need to discuss that. But gathering data, looking at best practices is really important. And I wanted to focus a little bit on Canada's best practices. We have now put $2 billion into looking at gender around the world and helping to fund gender around the world. And in that, one of the foci is conflict prevention. And I know we talked about the protracted conflicts and people talked about Ukraine. I was in Ukraine last summer, and they have in fact been helped with funding from OSCE and um, from Canada to look at how they integrated all women into all aspects of their conflict issues. And in fact, they've done so very successfully, and it is going to work because of that. And so I just wanted to make sure that we recognize that women have a real role to play and that we need to do this and not just talk about it. It's not just a politically correct thing. It's something that has processes and clear data and clear outcomes that we can look at. Thank you. Thank you very much. In her national capacity, Mrs. Sofio Kazarava, Georgia. Thank you very much. Uh, since it's my uh, first time on this panel, I quickly wanted to thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for your warm welcome, and I look forward to working with all of you in my new capacity as the Vice Chair of this committee. Uh, I would like to make a few remarks on the protracted uh, conflicts. However, uh, I cannot leave um, the comment of Mr. Onishenko unanswered uh, on the Lugar uh, Center, uh, as it has become the target of the Russian uh, propaganda campaign, uh, especially intensive over uh, the recent couple of years, um, groundlessly alleg alleging the center to be a military agency of the United States, which uh, carries out dangerous uh, uh, experiments and prepares biological weapons. So the reality is that the center is a unique laboratory uh, in Georgia that contributes to reducing the public health threats and increases safety of our country. We have invited Russian experts several times to Georgia to join the center. Uh, 
uh, amongst them last November uh, to join specifically the peer review exercise, uh, but that invitation has been yet again turned down. So we are accountable to our uh, public and uh, it is important that we share the information, the truth, uh, uh, so that the public knows where the truth lies. Moving to the protracted conflicts, uh, 10 years have passed since the mm, uh, launch of the Geneva International discussions uh, and many pe people criticize in fact the format for lacking progress in different areas. Indeed, despite the tremendous efforts taken by the co-chairing organizations and us, we have not achieved concrete deliverables in the peaceful settlement of the conflict. On the very contrary, security and humanitarian situation uh, has significantly aggravated and conflict affected population is suffering under increased isolation, restrictions and pressure. Nobody doubts that the GID and IPRN together have been successful in preventing the large-scale escalation of conflict and open hostilities, especially against the backdrop of daily provocations on the ground. The situation would have been much worse if not these formats. However, we need to see a clear picture. The absence of open armed hostilities does not mean peace either. Throughout a decade, we continue to live in a state of continuous occupation. I do not want to abuse uh, your time. I could talk uh, a lot more about the protracted conflicts. Um, however, one very important point is to, to ensure that the implementation of the ceasefire agreement is a cornerstone of lasting peace and security on the ground and that's something that I wanted to make it clear to consider for future um, as there is no um, justice without peace and there is no peace without justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Mr. Nabi Auchi, Turkey. Thank you, Mr. President, dear Chair and dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to share the positive messages and expectations of Iran about the coming negotiations between the Turkish and Greek Cypriots. And being a country of the region, Turkey attaches great, great importance to the security and stability of South Caucasus. Regarding the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, we underline once again the often used remark that the statu quo in the conflict is neither acceptable nor sustainable. As a member of the Minsk Group, Turkey rem remains committed to supporting all efforts to find a just, viable and lasting solution to the conflict through peaceful means and respectful of Azerbaijan's sovereignty and territorial integrity in line with the relevant UN Security Council resolutions. We attach importance to the fullest possible use of the Minsk Group as an instrument to support these efforts. We support all efforts to bring a comprehensive and sustainable solution to the conflict in Georgia. <clears throat> that is respectful of the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of Georgia. <clears throat> we see the Geneva International Discussions as the key platform for addressing the issues stemming from this conflict. Turkey supports the settlement for Moldova's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And as a last remark, I would like to thank his Excellency Ambassador Arturul Apakan, whose mandate as the Chief Monitor of OEC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine will come to an end next month. Thanks to him and to his team for the extraordinary mission they accomplished. Thank you very much. Thank you. We come to Mrs. Naziba Sadikova, Tajikistan. Уважаемый председатель, уважаемые коллеги, 
Разрешите поблагодарить за столь содержательное выступление по поводу разрешения затяжных конфликтов и сделанный акцент господина Анфарова по поводу привлечения еще больше привлечения роли женщин в разрешении конфликтогенных ситуаций, особенно в Афганистане. Наиболее значимым международно правовым фактором геополитического положения Республики Таджикистан в Центральноазиатском регионе является локализация территории государства, граничащей с исламским государством Афганистан, которое охватывает более 1344 километров и признано на сегодняшний день одним из нестабильных регионов планеты, где оптимизировались террористические организации, распространяется религиозный экстремизм, производство наркотиков и ее незаконно наоборот, происходит накопление банформирования членов террористической организации Исламского государства, сохраняется тенденция к дестабилизации обстановки вследствие родства террористической, экстремистской и иной преступной активности. Президент Республики Таджикистан Эммали Рахмон неоднократно высказывал свое опасение по этому поводу, также на эту проблему распространения влияния в Афганистане, обратил внимание генеральный секретарь ООН Заиша о том, что бывшие командиры активно переходим на сторону ИГИЛ, которые предпринимают попытки расширения своего влияния на другие страны, особенно на страны Центральной Азии. Возрушие опасений нашей страны связано с тем, что за последние годы появились тенденции концентрации террористических группировок в северной части Афганистана, которые граничат с Таджикистаном. Мы убеждены, что быстрее, чем быстрее будет решен афганский вопрос, тем лучше не только для стран региона, но и всего мирового сообщества. Считаем важным, чтобы парламентарии всех мировых держав приняли исчерпывающие меры по началу межкомпетенции межафганского диалога. Благодарю за внимание. Dear colleagues, we still have nine speakers and closing remarks of our experts, so I suggest that we close our discussion at 12 o'clock. And I thank the translator interpreters for their patience. I come to Mr. Refat Khubarov, Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President. In 2014, in the attack of Russian forces in Crim, the imitation of Russian military forces in the referendum, carried out by the soldiers of Russian soldiers, the use of the population for the blockade of Ukrainian garnizons, я жил и работал в Крыму. Это позже. Русские оккупанты запретили мне жить дома, в Крыму. Для членов российской делегации, считающих, что у их коллег по ОБСЕ короткая память, напомню лишь один сюжет о том, как российские войска не пустили в Крым в начале марта 2014 года военных наблюдателей ОБСЕ. Понятно же почему, чтобы ОБСЕ глазами своих наблюдателей не увидела, как орды русских оккупантов захватывают Крым. Уважаемые коллеги, я вспомнил этот сюжет еще и потому, чтобы продемонстрировать, насколько беспомощны существующие инструменты ОБСЕ в случае прямого военного вторжения агрессора на территорию другого государства, как это происходит в случае войны России против Украины. В эти дни исполняется пять лет оккупации Крыма, но, как известно, специальная мониторинговая миссия ОБСЕ так и не может въехать в Крым. Между тем, русская оккупационная власть уничтожает уникальные природные объекты Крыма, разрушает исторические памятники, переселяет граждан России на оккупированную украинскую территорию, репрессирует крымских татар и этнических украинцев. Сегодня очевидно для всех, что русская оккупационная власть Крыму целенаправленно вытесняет за пределы полуострова крымских татар, коренной народ Крыма. Путин стремится повторить путь Сталина, депортировавшего крымско-татарский народ в 1944 году. В Москве, видимо, думают, что вытеснив крымских татар, они превратят Крым в исконно русский край. На самом деле, вся эта военная авантюра России завершится международным трибуналом, когда на скиме подсудимых окажутся все те, кто оккупировал Крым, кто виноват в убийстве более 13 тысяч украинских граждан, те, кто продолжает совершать в оккупированном Крыму этноцит в отношении крымских татар и украинцев. Благодарю за внимание. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Iza Omurkulov, Kyrgyzstan. Спасибо, уважаемый президент, уважаемые коллеги. Достижение прогресса в разрешении затяжных конфликтов в регионе ОБСЕ, а также принятие устойчивых мирных решений в соответствии с принципом ОБСЕ и международного права является одним из приоритетов международной повестки. Но использовать инструменты установления мира и сделать шаг на пути к миру должны сами страны. Последние несколько лет продемонстрировало, что произойти каждое сотрудничество останавливается. То, что наша безопасность действительно неделима, не требует доказательств. Поэтому вместо того, чтобы идти по тупиковой конфронтации, все страны должны искать пути взаимовыгодного сотрудничества. Уважаемые коллеги, ОБСЕ является ключевым инструментом раннего предупреждения, предотвращения и решения конфликтов, урегулирования кризисов и постконфликтного восстановления. В области предотвращения и решения конфликтов требует нарушения потенциала местных партнеров в цели сокращения побудительных причин источников конфликта. Необходимо содействие обмена информацией между политическими и гражданскими субъектами для устранения рисков конфликта на самой ранней стадии, а также оказание помощи в облегчении диалога, посредничество деятельности по укреплению взаимного доверия между затронутыми конфликтом сторонами. И возможность сформировать достаточно степени общности без согласованных усилий, включающих разнообразные формы гражданского участия. Только при таком же расширенном участии возможна реализация общего представления на которых должно строиться продуктивное действие на сообщество безопасности. Кроме того, чтобы изменить текущую динамику, следует расширить методы традиционной дипломатии за счет ведения альтернативного диалога, за счет повышения открытости и взаимных уступок. Таким образом можно ослабить взаимное противостояние и укрепить доверие между народами, тем самым создавая условия для продвижения к урегулированию конфликтов. При урегулировании каждого конфликта государством следует сотрудничать, стимулируя переход от автократии к более плюрористическим системам государственного управления. Это позволит более прагматичным представителям его собственного и населения целом возложить на свое руководство ответственность за принятие решения в процессе урегулирования конфликта. Спасибо за внимание. Merci Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Rapporteur, Mesdames et Messieurs les, les Ambassadeurs, mes chers collègues. Notre débat spécial de, de ce matin appelle à débattre des outils et des mécanismes de l'OSCE pour résoudre les conflits prolongés. Je souhaiterais revenir sur l'un de ces conflits grevant l'espace de l'OSCE, le conflit opposant l'Arménie et l'Azerbaïdjan. Nous savons tous que le groupe de Minsk, coprésidé par les États-Unis, la France et la Russie, est chargé de garantir le maintien du processus de négociation et de promouvoir un processus de paix. Les coprésidents invitent à l'occasion le président à l'exercice de l'OSCE à participer à leur réunion, ce qui, je pense, est une bonne chose. Je tiens ici à réaffirmer la nécessité de résoudre les différents conflits dans les formats consacrés à l'OSCE. Toutefois, en dehors du groupe de Minsk, je m'interroge sur l'influence de l'OSCE et de ses organes pour contribuer au travail du groupe de Minsk. J'ai entendu tout à l'heure euh, le représentant du CPC euh, nous en parler et euh, je l'ai bien retenu manifestement et malheureusement. Le groupe de Minsk seul peine à trouver une issue pacifique acceptable pour les partis, contrairement à ce qui a été dit tout à l'heure par le représentant de l'Azerbaïdjan. L'objectif de chacun est de sortir de ce conflit, mais il dure et s'enlise. Des épisodes de violence sporadiques émaillent régulièrement cette trêve fragile. Je sais que la France, à regret, n'a toujours pas reconnu les autorités du Haut-Karabakh. Toutefois, je pense qu'il est regrettable que celle-ci ne soit pas présente dans les négociations. Et c'est un cas d'exception dans les différents conflits du même type, me semble-t-il. Ma question s'adresse donc à vous, s'adresse à nous tous. Comment l'OSCE pourrait-elle aider le groupe de Minsk dans sa mission de paix Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, M. Tessier. The floor is to Mr. Vitmir Bouchati, Albania. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, dear colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here for the first time as the head of uh, Albanian delegation, and I must admit I'm a little bit impressed by the vast area of uh, uh, competences that have been presented by all colleagues and going beyond the report and beyond the uh, agenda of our 
uh, meeting today. I would like to start by commending the work of the uh, CPC because uh, this report offers a useful guideline on how to deal with uh, uh, protracted conflicts in a very uh, unique context that international order is, is, is facing. There is a great reshuffling of pieces of uh, international order and we all know that we are being faced also with a crisis of the effectiveness and principles of contemporary international order and will not be able to get back on track as, as before. So we have to adapt to the new realities. And OSCE is uh, confronted with uh, a web of protracted conflicts that have been covered in the report, but also with a web of disputes and disagreements that do have the potential of becoming frozen conflicts. And here I'd like to refer specifically to the Balkans and to draw the attention of the CPC and of this House to dig a little bit uh, further into the dynamics of the inter-ethnic relations, especially in the Southeast Europe, because OEC has uh, uh, the, the, the toolkit, has the mechanism and a network of field presences uh, in the Western Balkans or Southeast Europe, which could be uh, very useful in overcoming the, uh, the, the, the uh, political instability in some parts of uh, in some parts of, of the Western Balkans. And I would like also to mention some of the key words which are already part of the OEC agenda, which could be further developed uh, in, in the Balkans. The work OEC is doing with youth, with women, it has been mentioned also by the Canadian colleague, uh, the gender issue. The reconciliation, uh, reconciliation process, which is very, very important. Uh, the work with the uh, uh, democratic state institutions and uh, the, the participatory democracy, which is uh, which is a key ingredient for uh, peace and stability in the region. And why not to draw some lessons from the way how uh, long-standing disputes, such as that between uh, Skopje and Athens, have been overcome. So there is also a need to uh, to adapt to the focus of the OEC in our in our area in Southeast Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, Mrs. Bahar Muradova, Azerbaijan. Спасибо. Уважаемый председатель, согласно соответствующим решениям и документам ОБСЕ, организация является ключевым инструментом урегулирования конфликтов, а также раннего предупреждения и ранних действий, предотвращения конфликтов, урегулирования кризисов и постконфликтного восстановления. Каждый из этих элементов является неотъемлемой частью концепции ОБСЕ о конфликтном цикле. Каждый из них имеет одинаковое значение и заслуживает равного внимания в контексте усилий по укреплению инструментария ОБСЕ. Посредничество является важным элементом деятельности ОБСЕ. Необходимо дальнейшее улучшение инструментария ТПК в области посреднической деятельности. Соответственно, эта деятельность должна проводиться исключительно в соответствии с нормами и принципами международного права, принципами нейтралитета, беспристрастности, соблюдения согласованного мандата. Мы с сожалением отмечаем отсутствие в деятельности ОБСЕ должного внимания к проблеме внутренне перемещения лиц и беженцев. Совершенно непостижимо, что в условиях усугубляющегося положения беженцев и внутренне перемещенных лиц в регионе ОБСЕ этот важный аспект постконфликтного восстановления все еще отсутствует в деятельности организации. В свете существующих обязательств, связанных с внутренне перемещенными лицами и беженцами, ОБСЕ и ее соответствующие исполнительные структуры должны выделять адекватные ресурсы на мероприятия, направленные на решение проблем этой уязвимой группы. А насчет участия незаконного режима на переговорах, хочу сказать, что в соответствии с решением, принятым на заседании Совета министров ОБСЕ, в 1999 году, в то время СБСЕ, Армения и Азербайджан определены как стороны конфликта. 
а армянская, азербайджанская община Нагорно-Карабахского региона Азербайджана определены как заинтересованные стороны. После вывода войск, конечно, с Армении, с оккупированных территорий Азербайджана, обе общины на равноправной основе смогут принять участие в обсуждениях. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо большое, господин Николай Брукин, Russian Federation. Большое спасибо, уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемые коллеги. Обсуждение темы затяжных конфликтов считаю архиважной в работе ОБСИ. Курс НАТО на силовое сдерживание России подрывает основу для модернизации венского документа ОБСИ 2011 года о мерах укрепления доверия и безопасности. Такие меры нельзя выстроить в рамках конфронтации, политики, санкций и отказа от военного сотрудничества. Уважаемые господа, развал договора, ликвидация ракет средней и меньшей дальности способен тяжело ударить по глобальной стабильности, привести к эрозии архитектуры контроля над вооружением негативными последствиями для режима договора о нераспространении ядерного оружия. Решение о сломе ДРСМД вызрело у США Давно Вашингтон полномерно реализовывал это намерение. Мы предприняли все допустимые с военно-политической точки зрения усилия для спасения договора. Предложили США набор конкретных мер по урегулированию заверенных претензий, пошли на беспрецедентную транспарентность за рамками наших обязательств, чтобы на фактах доказать, что мы его не нарушали. Однако все наши инициативы были отвергнуты. Славящаяся ситуация несет риски для национальной безопасности России. Мы должны готовиться к потенциальному размещению американских ракет на территории, откуда они могут снести для нас прямую угрозу. Этим продиктованы принятые у нас на высшем уровне решения о симметричных по времени сдержанных ответных мер. Они включают встречную пристановку выполнения ДСНД. В качестве зеркального шага было вынуждено ответить на разработку американцами новых ракетных систем. Однако Россия не заинтересована в новых ракетных кризисах. Президент России четко заявил, что мы станем, не станем разворачивать наземные РСДНД, пока в соответствующих регионах не будут размещаться американские ракеты аналогичного класса. По сути, с нашей стороны речь идет об одностороннем монатории. Намерены ее удержать, пока не позволят обстоятельства. Не намерены быть стороной, намечающей затяжного конфликта в данном направлении, готовы к всестороннему обсуждению данной темы. Благодарю вас за внимание. Thank you very much. Mr. Хайк Конжурян. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. At the outset, I would like to stress that protracted conflicts in the OSCE area are different and unique in their root causes, essence, principles of resolution, and agreed negotiation formats. Therefore, attempt to generalize those by putting them under one title shapes a simplistic and wrong conceptual basis for our debate. Primary role of parliamentary assembly is in full and unequivocal political support to the agreed formats dealing with various conflicts and their activities. Activities. Such support needs to be reflected in declarations of parliamentary assembly. Parliamentary diplomacy is an important tool for support of agreed formats through supporting various confidence-building initiatives, including people-to-people -people contacts. Still, it can have added value only if it, it, if it is inclusive. I would like to recall in this regard signing of Bishkek Protocol in May 1994 by heads of parliaments of Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan, which established ceasefire. Uh, OSC Budapest Summit uh, decision recognized the signatures of the ceasefire agreement as parties to the conflict. Uh, regrettably, our debate lacks inclusiveness, in particular engagement with key parties to the conflict. Speaking, out, uh, speaking about the role of parliamentary assembly in regard to the protracted conflict, I would like to touch upon the problem of access of the members of PA to, the, to people residing in conflict areas and their elected authorities. This problem has been raised by former PA special representative on South Caucasus in his report. Denial of access to the conflict areas and mere engagement with elected authorities of key party to the conflict drastically limit any role the PA could have in its regard. Dear colleagues, the peaceful, 
Non-violent velvet revolution reaffirmed existing strong consensus in our society on Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. I would like to stress the key role of democracy and human rights in creating conductive ground for the peace process. We attach strong importance to strengthening of democratic institutions and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms as prerequisites for resolution of the conflict. I would like also to react on the point of Turkish delegate on Nagorno-Karabakh. By sealing borders with Armenia and uh, unilaterally supporting one party to the conflict against Armenia, Turkey became part of the problem, not its solution. Thus, we call on Turkey not to serve as impediments towards preparation of populations to peace. And finally, I would like to ask distinguished representatives of CPC whether they have freedom to contact with all parties to the conflict, including de facto authorities, and whether they see useful such contacts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Second last speaker, Mr. Tahir Mirkishili, Azerbaijan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, the protracted conflicts is very the big, cha uh, big challenge and very danger for the, the whole Europe also. If you see what's happening in Europe, especially in Spain, we can uh, think about it, that how this conflict is very dangerous. So we are negotiating some of the conflicts more than 25 years, especially between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And I think we have to learn some lessons from the history, and we have to make some of the changes also. Uh, by the way, I just want to remark that uh, the head of the Azerbaijan community of the Nagorno-Karabakh have invited several times the, the Armenian community of Nagorno-Karabakh to meet and to discuss with them, but every time we received rejects and every time they refused to talk with them. It means that the Azerbaijan community is very open and we are actually ready to change uh, some mechanism in the system also. And the next one, I think that uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan is not closed, and it's open for everybody, especially the member of parliament also, but the visit of the region should be with the legal ways, not the illegal ways. If somebody just wants to visit the region, they can apply to the Minister of Foreign of Azerbaijan, and the region is open, even we can support, even we can uh, advise how to visit the region and so on. But I think that uh, from, uh, to learn from the lesson, I want to remark some. So we need for a new mechanism that to solve the conflicts. We need for the proactive approach, actually, not just to be intermediary, but we need for the change the approach also. We need the uniform approach to all of the conflicts in Georgia, in Azerbaijan, in Moldova, in everybody. We have to refuse from the populist calls. We have to not occupy and we have to occupy the other's territory. And the last, uh, we have to base on the international law adopted by everyone. Without these principles to solve the conflicts, it will be impossible, but we have to solve the conflicts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last speaker, Mr. Nikolai Rizak, Russian Federation. Благодарю господин председатель за высокую честь завершить нашу дискуссию. Мы взяли слово для того, чтобы еще раз подчеркнуть, что иногда провокации играют важную роль в достижении политических целей. Вот перед нами выступил представитель Украины господин Чубаров и говорил о росте терроризма, о том, что крокодиловые слезы лил по поводу судьбы крымско-татарского народа. Это именно этот человек взрывал линии электропередач и телевизионные картинки, сюжеты у нас сохранились. У нас длинная память, господин Кучубаров, мы это все помним. Именно вы лишали крымско-татарский народ света и тепла на полуострове Крым. И второе, по поводу провокаций в Керченском проливе. Мы заранее получили информацию о готовящейся провокации. Мы напоминаем, что перед этим караван украинских судов благополучно совершил такой проход по Керченскому проливу, и никто ему не препятствовал, потому что были выдержаны все процедурные нормы. В данном случае эти нормы не выдерживались. В данном случае представители спецслужб, которые находились на военных судах, 
в течение нескольких часов игнорировали требования пограничной службы изменить курс и соблюсти необходимые нормы. Поэтому были применены меры по задержанию. Кроме того, все эти люди дали признательные показания о том, что они участники готовящейся провокации. Но я предупреждаю высокое собрание. Есть информация, что следующий караван и прорыв будет осуществляться с участием представителей иностранных граждан что уже будет чревато крупным международным конфликтом. Благодарю вас за внимание. Будьте бдительны, не забудем слова знаменитого Юлия Сафучика. Спасибо. Well, thank you very much. Um, a lot of what I heard in the room confirmed uh, the assessment that we are in a situation of erosion of trust. And of course, each conflict being hot or protracted is an element of that. So what can we actually do in the current situation to reverse this erosion of trust? Um, I would have seven, a package of seven measures which I would wish we would have the wisdom and strength to tackle on right right now. We need um, more incident prevention mechanism first. Second, we need arms control discussions, if it's not ready for negotiation, but at least discussions to uh, be resumed. We need small arms and light weapons to be uh, prevented from uh, proliferation in the OSCE area, because actually and currently in, in all these conflicts we have touched upon, they are the weapons of mass destruction, de facto, and they are killing today. Um, uh, force measure, we need our verific military verification activities to be upgraded. Fifth, we need military exercises to be more transparent. And sixth, we need private military and security companies to be controlled in their activities. They must be actors of stability, but not of instability. If they are, they must be banned for entering conflict areas. And seventh, we need more uh, military-to-military -military, uh, contacts uh, as the diplomatic channels on uh, security are very uh, low now. Military to military contacts are very important. That would be my uh, resume for the discussion. Merci beaucoup, Ambassador. Uh, la parole à Monsieur Paul Picard. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Um, I would like to thank also all um, the comments that were made and also uh, share our gratefulness for your support. As the PA, as we have seen and discussed and throughout these two days, is a very important tool that we have in our hands. Having served uh, for the past 10 years in OSCE, I have seen the organization from various angles, from the field operations, being myself a head of mission during a time of crisis, and also from here at the Secretariat. And I can tell you that I appreciate the OSCE as an outstanding organization and very dedicated uh, staff uh, um, within its structures, all executive structures. And um, I would like to stress that the Conflict Prevention Center will continue to support the chairmanship and the participating states in providing all the efforts to making sure that the tools and mechanisms established here uh, in this organization by consensus are available and with, uh, made available with an A single to support our PS and serving uh, the people in all OSC area. Uh, Charles. Um. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the comments and for uh, the observations which we certainly take note of. Um, I note Mr. Bubushati's comments on the work of the OSC in Southeast Europe. Um, it's perhaps some interesting examples there of some of the other issues that were raised, for example, um, on the, the work of youth and reconciliation. We are closely involved in supporting the work of the Regional Youth Cooperation Office uh, and look forward to continuing that. Uh, and also on gender, um, we have, for example, the Follow Us initiative, which brought together prominent women from Belgrade and Pristina. Um, so there are a number of very concrete areas where we can try to promote these things, but picking up some of those points that were raised. More broadly, I can only underline our commitment to addressing conflicts uh, at all stages of the conflict cycle. 
as some interventions noted, ultimately this is a question of political will, um, but we will certainly continue to do all that we can to support, to encourage that where the openings exist. Um, on the specific question raised about uh, contacts with all parties, um, all I can really do is, is just note again the distinction that I would draw between the work of the facilitators, in this case the Minsk Group co-chairs, and the work of the Secretariat in supporting the format but not being directly engaged in that. So this is perhaps a question that uh, should really be directed to the, the Minsk Group co-chairs themselves rather than us as the supporters or the facilitators for the process but not as part of the process. Thank you. Thank you very much to our uh, three speakers. Uh, my conclusion is that uh, where there is a will to resolve a conflict, then all our instruments are helpful, work, all mediation can work. Where there is, where there is no will or the, the interest of conflict prevail, then you can have all the mechanism you want and you want to uh, achieve so much. But this is our responsibility, all of us as politicians uh, and as diplomats and uh, also as members of this Honorable uh, Assembly to do our best to reach these goals. Thank you very much for this uh, debate. Thank you to our speakers and our rapporteur will have, uh, I think, enough staff for preparing uh, his document for Luxembourg. Colleagues, we move to the last item of the agenda today. Any other business? Does any member wish to raise any other business at this time? It doesn't seem the, time, the case, so we can uh, go and can proceed to the closing of our session. I thank all of you for uh, your participation. The committee will next meet in Luxembourg in July. I look forward to seeing you there, and I now declare to 2019 winter meeting of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly's General Committee on Political Affairs and Security closed. Bon appétit.